something is worth taking the precaution of because some people here have depression or some relatives have depression and are of the same. And then for record purpose, Tony here, please ask your full name. Name and full name. Full name. I can name Ikan Kaiko. Bear Diane Kimo Kaiko. So you can name it? Bear Shomo. Let's speak to them now. Speak to them now. Yes. It is on. It's on. Yeah. Okay. Let's go back. Right up there. Okay. Happy. Yes. Okay. Dale Chomo. Yes. Then uh, do you share that the evidence that we shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? If that is the case, raise your right hand and say, So help me God. So help me God. Yes, may I also just uh, advise you, the lady next to you is a, a sign language practitioner. I've been advising also some witnesses who testified before you that we uh, request witnesses not to use hands when they speak. Try to avoid that way. And you are correct because we were told that the best way of avoiding using hands you is to put your uh, hands uh, beneath the breast. And then because if uh, a person uses hands, the audience that rely on sign language gets confused because our signs normally are not the official signs that are used by the uh, sign language practitioners. Thank you very much, Chairperson. The witness has finished her name. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Banyan. <coughs> okay, then uh, we're going to hand over now to Okay. Uh, firstly, before we hand you over to the evidence leader, let me introduce you to the panel. The panel that will be guiding these uh, proceedings is first, uh, I am the chairperson of the panel, and my name is Vukang Katla Malang. And uh, I'll ask the other panelists <coughs> to introduce themselves. I am a member of the panel, and I'm a commissioner of the <coughs> South African Human Rights Commission, and my name is J.D. Sibanya. Good morning. I'm the panelist. <laughs> my name is Professor Tsepo Matlingozi, and I teach at Rhodes University. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Commissioner Zbanyani, Professor Asomi. And then uh, I'm going to ask the evidence leaders also to introduce themselves. Good morning. Um, my name is Kai Fuga. I'll be leading the evidence this morning. morning. I am Nene Kimakonge, uh, an advocate. Thank you very much. Now, I'm going to hand over now the proceedings to the evidence leaders. Um, I, d I don't mind. You can call me Dale. You can call me Swell. I'm very comfortable with that. Um, thank you so much, Dale. Um, we'd like to just proceed that you um, go ahead and provide your presentation, and then the questions will come thereafter. Okay. 
Thank you very much. Good morning, commissioners. Good morning, chair. Good morning, evidence leaders. Is that the correct term? And everybody else listening, thank you so much for this opportunity for the ARB to present. I have to say, when I walked in here this morning, I was nervous about difficult questions. Now I'm nervous about using my hands while I speak. <laughs> <laughs> this is very difficult for me. I had prepared a presentation. Um, I understood it would be shown to you. <gasps> See my hand. I understood it would be shown to you, but I'm going to read you through it. Um, so please bear with me as I, as I read through the presentation. I'm starting the presentation the opposite from how I did my submission. I'm starting my presentation with the three suggestions that the ARB are putting to the Commission. Because the ARB, as an organization, are all about solutions. We're all about finding solutions to problems. We're all about fixing things for consumers, and we're all about the protection of consumers. So we have three suggestions to the Commission. The first are that the Commission and the ARB can work together to work on the enforcement problems that the ARB has, and I will talk about those in more detail. The second is that the ARB and the Commission can partner to do proper research into this problem in South Africa, in depth, deep dive research into the nature of the problem and the extent of the problem, and I will talk about that more. And my, our third suggestion is that the ARB and the Commission can partner to give holistic training to the industry around discrimination. And I will speak more about why we believe that that is necessary. Obviously, we have to start with what is the ARB. The ARB is the Advertising Regulatory Board. Many of you will have heard of the Advertising Standards Authority. That is the organization you, that might feel more familiar, especially to those of us who are a bit older. Um, the Advertising Standards Authority was liquidated in 2018, or went into liquidation in 2018. And the ARB stepped into the shoes of the AS ASA to administer the industry-owned code of advertising practice. It's important it is an industry-owned document. The industry gives input to it. Um, it is based on international codes, but it is, it is something crafted by the South African marketing and advertising industry. Very importantly, the ARB looks at content of advertising. We don't look at placement of advertising unless the content and the placements have an overlap. Um, there are a number of issues we don't look at. We look at the content of advertising, and we are a reactive organization. We react to complaints. So we don't pre-clear advertising, and I suspect we will touch on that more. Um, we are a self-regulatory organization. We are not a government uh, body. We are not um, commissioned in any way by government. Um, we are a non-profit company. And our full terms of reference are set out in our MOI, and our MOI is available on our website for anybody who wants more information around that. Okay. I'm going to speak briefly to the need for an organization like the ARB. There are many organizations that touch on advertising issues. So you have the National Consumer Commission, you have the Consumer Goods Ombud, you have the South African Human Rights Commission that to some extent touches on some issues of advertising. But we need a body, first of all, that considers non-member material. That's a controversial issue, and I will talk about that more. That has some enforcement processes. We are recognized by the Electronic Communications Act, and in terms of that, we are binding on broadcasters. My third point is very important. That is speedy enough for advertising. We need speed in rulemaking, we need speed in reaction, and we need speed in decisions. Um, we sit here conducting a commission into a matter that, that from my understanding, the, the incident that has led rise to this commission is the Clicks Tresemme ad. That's an incident that happened 18 months ago, and I'm going to talk about the steps that we have taken <coughs> in the interim um, to, to address this because we are all about reacting with speed. We need a body that considers all advertising issues. So you have bodies that consider 
motor vehicles. You have bodies that consider consumer goods. But the ARB considers any advertising issue that arises in all industries. And very importantly, we are aligned to international standards. That is important because when a multi multinational company comes into South Africa, they want to know that the regulation of advertising is in some way familiar to them. It, it follows the standards that are followed all over the world. So we're based on international codes, but we've made it South African. We address South African problems. Okay, let me move on to what the code says about discrimination. Um, and I think it's important to know this is not a new issue in advertising regulation. The issue of discrimination has always been in the code, and it, has, it is in o codes all over the world. Um, so, so this is not something that has not been considered before. Okay. Clause 3.4 of Section 2 of the code, which is correctly cited in the terms of reference, reads, No advertisements may contain content of any description that is discriminatory, unless in the opinion of the ARB, such discrimination is reasonable and justifiable in an open and democratic society based on human dignity, equality, and freedom. Very familiar to all of us, it echoes the, the Constitution, and always our code has to be in line with the Constitution. What's important here is what does discriminatory mean? Prior to March 2021, and I'm loath to read you this long, boring definition, but I'm going to because you can't see it for yourselves. The definition of discrimination was any act or omission, including a policy, law, rule, practice, condition, or situation, which directly or indirectly imposes burdens, obligations, or disadvantages on or withholds benefits, opportunities, or advantages from any person on one or more of the following grounds. Race, gender, sex, pregnancy, marital stated, status, ethnic or social origin, color, sexual orientation, age, disability, religion, conscience, belief, culture, language, and birth or any other analogous, analogous, I don't even know how to say that, ground. And discriminate and discriminatory have corresponding meanings. When the clicks matter occurred, we took a number of steps. And the one step was to go back to our code and say, is our code still serving us? This is quite an old document. Is this definition still serving us? Because this definition was really about a situation where, and I'm afraid to say it's a situation we still see, where something is advertised not available to a particular group. Um, we, we all know the problem of accommodation that when you phone and your name is a black name, suddenly it's not available. It's that type of advertising that this clause was about. But we asked ourselves, is that enough for where we are today? And we felt it was not. So in March 2021, we passed the following amendment. We kept that original piece, and I'm not going to reread that, but we added, discrimination means advertising where a person or group is negatively stereotyped or portrayed in a manner that exploits or, deme or demeans or restricts and entrenches their role in society. We took the wording from our gender clause, and we took the wording from international documents on discrimination, and this now goes to those ads we're talking about, where there is a demeaning aspect, where there is an aspect where people are being stereotyped, where roles are being entrenched. And I think the Commission has heard in the last day some talk about how advertising entrenches roles. And for me, that's a really important conversation, a really important issue, and we are proud that we have brought our code up to speed to deal with that type of issue. Okay. I now need to move to the question, 
of is there really a problem? And the question of is there really a problem, I think is answered by none of us know. We need to do proper deep dive research into the advertising industry, into advertising to figure out if there is a problem. But we can look at the stats that the ARB has. In 2021, re we received a total of 630 complaints. Our process involves an initial evaluation for validity and whether we have jurisdiction and all the information we need, and only about 20% of complaints are formally investigated. It's mostly we don't get all the detail we need. It can be that we don't have jurisdiction, and then there's a large amount that are because people are absolutely crazy, and the things that we receive complaints about you would not believe. Um, but in 2021, of those 630 complaints, we picked up three complaints. That's 0,4% that relate to racism or discrimination. Of those, only one was upgraded, and that one was not actually about race. It was about discrimination of people below the poverty line and two were not formally investigated. The one was not formally investigated because it was not, in fact, an advertisement. It was a very strange spoof trying to look like an advertisement, but we didn't have jurisdiction over it. And the second one was one that we felt did not have validity. The complainant was not viewing the, co the advertising correctly. This must be seen in the context, and now I want to be very clear here, I don't have the exact figures, and I'm under oath, so I'm giving you a figure that is the figure, I, the last figure I was able to get out of the industry. I hope the commission has better luck than I have in getting exact figures out of the industry, how much we spend in advertising. But the figure that I have heard is 15 billion rand in formal advertising sector. So that's television, radio, newspaper, I do not know how accurate my figure is. But if we take the 15 billion rand ad spend as the figure, we have to see three complaints to the ARB in the context of 15 billion rand ad spend. And we have to ask ourselves, is racial discrimination in advertising the thing that is worrying the man in the street? And I can tell you from my experience, the thing that is worrying the man in the street is that the chicken is advertised for X price and he went to the shop and it cost Y price. That is the thing we get the most complaints about. That being said, I do think there is a problem. And I do not want my words to be interpreted to minimize that problem. I believe that the problem is more widespread then our figures show. And I believe that that is because with discrimination, whether it is racial, whether it is gender, whether it is another ground, the most dangerous type of advertising is subtle stereotyping. And subtle stereotyping is not the type of thing that we are getting complaints about. And perhaps if one thing comes out of my presentation to this audience, it will be that the act the activists amongst the audience see the ARB as a place they can come and we will start getting more complaints about the things that are actually a problem. So I do think we need to be understanding the problem more. Okay, turning to our enforcement. The jurisdiction of the ARB has traditionally been as follows. We have jurisdiction over our members. We have jurisdiction over broadcasters in terms of the Electronic Communications Act, Section 55. We do not have jurisdiction over non-members, but we can make decisions on the advertising of non-members for the guidance of our members and our stakeholders. So that means if a rogue advertiser advertises something unacceptable, I can't go to them and say, you have to pull your ad. But I can go to my members and stakeholders and say, we do not want you to accept this ad. 
Now, this was challenged in court last year, and the High Court found our actions to be unconstitutional. Our appeal to the Supreme Court of Appeal was heard on the 1st of March. When I made my submissions, I talked about how we are unsure about the outcome, how we have to put things in place to deal with the outcome. Following the hearing, I'm a little bit more confident of the outcome. The case went, as far as we can see, very well, and we are confident that the court is going to find our actions to be constitutional. But you never know. Um, we continue to look at ways to better our enforcement. We continue to look at ways to make self-regulation the norm for all advertisers rather than just a group of advertisers. And that means our recommendation remains that we can work together with the Commission to look at whether the Commission has ways that they can help us coming out of this inquiry. I do want to emphasize again we are a self-regulatory organization, and we want to remain a self-regulatory organization. There are many reasons that I, I can go into, should the Commission wish, that self-regulation is what the industry believes is correct for it. Okay. From that, I want to move to the research question, and I want to briefly address the scope for research. This is something that's happening all over the world. I think... In South Africa, we have a danger of thinking we are the only people who deal with these problems um, because it is so top of mind for us. But racial discrimination is an issue all over the world, and it is a hot issue all over the world. The UK and India have both done some inspiring research in this area. I shared some of the UK's thinking with the Commission in my submissions. I'm not going to go into detail about that. But what we would love, and we are... We are a body with um, limited resources. We would love to partner with the Commission to do proper research into advertising in South Africa and whether or not there is a problem at a broad level with discrimination in advertising, what that problem is and what we can do about it. And obviously, we have the wonderful opportunity to benchmark against other countries who have already done this type of research. The next suggestion we made is around training. It is our opinion, and our opinion only, um, I'm under oath, this is not fact, this is opinion, that the major cause of the type of error that we saw in the clicks tresemme matter is threefold. Number one, complete ignorance and tone deafness. Number two, junior people of color feeling unable to speak up in creative meetings. This is something that worries me immensely. And number three, insufficient transformation in staffing. So you have a situation where either there is not a correctly um, diverse room when people are making creating ads, or you have a diverse room, but they are not empowered to speak up because they are junior members of the, of the creative team. They don't know the rules about advertising and feel afraid to speak up with the backup of the rules. And the solution lies in training. There are two types of training that we would suggest, although the one with a bit of learning from the international world. There's training in unconscious bias to address the issue of complete ignorance or tone deafness. And there's training in knowledge of the code, because knowledge of the code would enable those creatives to speak up. They're not speaking up and saying, I've got a discomfort with this. They're speaking up and saying, Clause 3.4 of the Code of Advertising Practice says X, Y, and Z. What we have learned from our, our sister organizations in other countries, both the UK and Holland have done unconscious bias training. The self-regulatory organizations in those countries are not convinced that it has achieved any measurable change. So, you, ha you know, you don't want to do something where there's a lot of talk and a lot of, a lot of action, but it ma brings no change. We want to do something that brings meaningful change, so we need to learn f lessons from our sister organizations. It is also distressing to note that immediately after the clicks matter, we immediately looked at this problem, and we immediately offered training to our industry. 
And while there was a lot of talk about how the industry needed training, when we offered the training, only one agency took us up on the offer. In the last few days, I've been doing a lot of thinking about why was that the case. My opinion <laughs> is that, as with so often with racism, we all recognize there's a problem with racism, but none of us think it's our problem. We all think we are not the racist in the room. Everybody else is the racist in the room. And I think that that might be what happened with the training. All the agencies thought, we are not the problem agency. Everyone else is the problem agency. But we believe that training in the code will empower people, and we would love to partner with the commission, again, to offer training in, in, in the code around the issues of discrimination. And then I've got a slide that's got my email address and our website address and our Twitter handle. And after all the tweeting I saw yesterday, I'm quite relieved I'm not sharing my email address with the world on a big screen. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Gil and uh, Shmuel. I will now ask uh, the evidence leader to put uh, any questions and questions of clarification to the witness. Evidence leaders. Thank you, Ms. Gale, for that brief background and your presentation. For the purposes of the report, we shall be going through similar questions uh, for, for more clarity into that. Could you kindly provide a brief background on how the Advertising Regulatory Board was formed? Okay. So the Advertising Standards Authority of South Africa was founded um, approximately, it must now be 55 years ago, by the industry coming together um, it is when I talk about the industry, I'm talking about the marketers, the media, and the advertising industry, the advertising agencies. And they came together and decided self-regulation was the path for them. They followed the international norms and the codes. They developed a code for South Africa, and the ASA was appointed to administer that code. Fast forward to 2015, the ASA went into business rescue. Um, there, are, there is a lot of talk about different reasons and a lot of speculation. I can tell you under oath that it was bad management around the funding system that led to the liquidation of the ASA and nothing more ominous than that. It was about money. It went into business rescue. I came on as the CEO under business rescue. We attempted to rescue the organization. We thought we had rescued it. We made an offer to the biggest creditor, which was SARS, which they informally said they would accept. We went to a meeting of the creditors, and SARS rejected the offer, sending the ASA into liquidation. At that point, the industry had to decide, do we want to save the ASA, or do we want to save self-regulation of advertising? And the decision was made to save self-regulation of advertising. And we allowed the ASA to go into liquidation, and we formed the ARB. The founding members of the ARB are MASA, which is the marketers, the IAB, which is the digital marketers and platforms, and the ACA, which is the traditional advertising agencies. Subsequent to that, the NAB, which is the National Association of Broadcasters, the pet food industry, and aware.org, which is the alcohol marketers, came on as members, and I am so scared that I'm leaving out a member, but I don't think I am. Um, and we, we, and so, so we, we formed the ARB, we have the Memorandum of Incorporation, and we formed it specifically to take over the work that the ASA was doing of administering the Code of Advertising Practice. And just for, for the purposes of clarity, that means we receive complaints from consumers and from businesses, we apply the code to the complaint, 
and where necessary, we make a decision. The decision is in the nature of an arbitration decision rather than a mediated decision. Um, although, when appropriate, we might do a small amount of mediation, we are basically a, a creature of arbitration. So you did indicate that the, you have the members of the, of the ARB. What are the benefits of joining the ARB and what is the, what's your function? Okay. <coughs> so, you know, <laughs> I feel now I'm in one of my meetings where I'm trying to persuade someone to fund us mm -hmm. um, because that is always the question. And the reality is membership of the ARB is because it is the right thing to do because that is what ethical advertisers want. They want a code of advertising practice and they want a body that makes an objective decision about that code of advertising practice. So that is the real benefit of being a member of the ARB. You're doing the ethically correct thing. There are some small other benefits Around, um, around the fees we charge to businesses for lodging complaints, around communication that we give to our members. But when it comes to membership, it's the knowledge that you are bound by a code and you have a body that is going to make decisions on that code to guide you. Is the membership of the ARB voluntary or compulsory? Sadly, it's voluntary. Uh, it is completely voluntary. Um, the way we work is through industry bodies. You will notice that when I named those members, I wasn't naming Unilever and Colgate and Procter & Gamble and all the big marketers. I was naming industry bodies. So the marketers or the agencies or the platforms will be members of the industry body and we will be binding on them through that membership. Um, I feel like I've lost track of your question, sorry. Um, the question was, I, you, did you were just elaborating further, is the membership of the ARB voluntary no. or compulsory? Okay. So, so those, those organizations all join us on a voluntary basis and any member of theirs is there as a voluntary basis. And this is one of the problems that if you suddenly, as a marketer, take it into your head that you're going to go rogue as an advertiser, you can just stop being a member of your member organization. And that's why it's important that we win the court case so that we can continue to make decisions for the guidance of our members and stakeholders. And remember, our members and stakeholders include the media. I say members and stakeholders because the broadcasters are members but the other media are not members at the moment. The other media are kind of bound in a voluntary way when they want to be. So they are interested in our decisions. They will usually apply our decisions, but at the moment they are not legally bound to apply our decisions. It's a very, it's a very gray area of how our jurisdiction works. Could you uh, explain the kind of complaints you do receive at the ARB? Okay. The bulk of our complaints, as I alluded to in my presentation, are around misleading advertising. So that, that, that can be broken down into two parts. It can be straightforward misleading. I saw this advertised for this price and I couldn't get it for this price or I saw that this product is supposed to do X, when I bought it, it didn't do X. Um, and then also substantiation. So we all know the type of advertising, use this cream and your wrinkles will be gone in 10 minutes, and then we will call on the advertiser to prove scientifically, will your wrinkles indeed be gone in 10 minutes? So that is the bulk of our work. But there are a lot of other issues that we deal with. We deal with harm to children, we deal with discrimination and gender discrimination. We deal with um, advertising that shows unsafe practices. 
We deal with when one advertiser imitates the advertising of another advertiser. We deal with if, if your face is used in an ad without your permission. Um, we deal with abuse of animals, although interestingly it's been a long time since we got a complaint about that. Um, I'm trying to picture our code. There are Our code is a large document. It is divided into three sections. The first section is about interpretation. The second section is the main rules, and there there are 19 clauses to the section. And the third section is industry-specific rules. We also have appendixes for specific industries where they have felt they needed more in terms of the rules specific for their industry. One that is under the spotlight at the moment, for example, is the social media appendix, which sets out the rules for influencers. Could you explain the procedure on how to lodge a complaint with the ARB? With pleasure. Um, anybody can lodge a complaint with the ARB. Any consumer can lodge a complaint with the ARB. And if I, if I make one point today, let it be that. Um, you can do it online on our website. There is a complaint form or you can send an email. We have been criticized about um, barriers to access of that complaint forum, but we are a legal, no, well, not a legal body. Um, we, we follow the rules of administrative justice. And in order for the advertiser to answer the complaint, they have to know what the complaint is. And that can only be done by reducing the complaint to writing. So that is why we require the complaint in writing. But we have an online form, or you can email us, tell us what the complaint is, what will happen at that point is if you haven't given us enough detail, we will ask for the detail that we need. We will source the advertisement. We will do a preliminary assessment of whether or not there is a valid complaint. So I will give one of my favorite examples. We had a complaint a few years ago where the woman said it was absolutely shocking. She went out and she saw a poster of a woman in her bra and she doesn't know how she is supposed to watch this. And when we asked a few questions, it turned out she was in an underwear shop when she saw a post of the woman in her bra. So at that stage, we'll go, we're not taking that further. You were in an underwear shop. It's appropriate in an underwear shop. Um, so, that, so, that, so we do that type of assessment. Um, then, as I said, 20% of our complaints will we'll upgrade to formal assessment. We will then give the advertiser an opportunity to respond. Like I said, we are very driven by the requirements of administrative law. So, audi alter and partum, you must allow the other side to, a chance to um, respond. And sometimes we don't get it. And then we have to make a decision on what's before us. When we do get it, we can make a decision on the papers, or, um, everything before us. We have three levels of decision making. The first is on the papers by what we call the directorate. Um, I am the person who runs the directorate and signs off the directorate decisions. I am a lawyer by training. We then have the first level of appeal, which is the Advertising Appeals Committee. That is chaired by senior counsel. It is currently um, Advocate Hamilton Manichi who chairs that committee. It was previously Advocate Daniel Berger. We try to get people who are well admired in the industry. And I see from the nodding of the evidence committee, we might have achieved this. Um, and then we have the final appeal committee, and that is chaired by Judge Bernard Nguepe. I, I should perhaps add, sorry, that at the Advertising Appeals Committee, the parties can come and make presentations, but we do not allow legal representation at that committee. At the final appeal committee is when it goes legally wild, and you can have senior counsel, you can have a team of attorneys, you can have whatever you want at that. What is the timeline of lodging a complaint and <coughs> resolving the complaint at the ARB? I see you do have the three stages. You have the directorate, the advertising appeal board, and the final appeal. How, how does it? Okay. So we aim, and I'm under oath, so I have to tell you it's an aim. We don't always achieve it. That from the time you lodge your complaint, the most you will wait for a directorate decision is 30 days. We don't 
always achieve it. Things can be more complicated. We can run into problems with getting, getting access to information, but we aim for 30 days from complaint to directorate decision. Once a directorate decision is issued, the parties have 10 days to appeal. Once the appeal is received, 10 days to respond, and we have a hearing every month for the Advertising Appeals Committee. So as soon as that matter has got an appeal and a response, we set it down for hearing. And then we have the final appeal committee where the parties have 20 days to lodge the appeal, 20 days to respond, and then we have to the final appeal committee we, we um, bring together ad hoc as we have a need for them. So depending on Judge and Nguepe's schedule will depend how quickly we can set that down. You will never have an ARB matter that takes more than a year to reach final decision. And I would regard it as a bit of a failure if it did take as much as, it, as a year. Obviously, after that, the parties can take the matter on review to court, and then it's out of our hands how long it takes. So when the ARB uh, finds maybe an advertising agency has breached, uh, there's a breach, in, your inv in the investigations. What are the punitive measures that you take against that agency? Okay. And what do you do going I forward? I think the first thing I need to clarify is we do not regard the agency as primarily responsible for advertising. We regard the marketer as primarily responsible for advertising. The reason being, when advertising works, who is it who gets the benefit? The marketer. So when there is a mistake in the advertising, which the marketer has signed off with their agency, it is the marketer who must take primary responsibility for the mistake in that advertising. So the agency will work with the marketer in responding to us, but it is the marketer who responds to us. Our primary aim is consumer protection, not industry punishment. And because of that, our primary um, sanction is withdrawal of the advertising. So when we find an advertisement has breached the code, we call on the parties to withdraw the advertisement, and then if they don't, there are a number of steps we can take regarding the breach of that decision. But it is all about consumer protection withdrawing the advertisement. We don't have fines. We don't have punishments like you're no longer a member, because that would be wonderful for them, because then they'd no longer be bound by the code. Um, and so. We, like I said, we, we are about consumer protection first and foremost. Um, can you explain um, the supply chain of advertising? Could you explain that? To, to I do not think that I am the best person to answer that question because it is not my area of expertise. My area of expertise is the regulation of the content of advertising. So I can give you my impressions, but bearing in mind I'm under oath, please take that these are my impressions. You have the marketer who commissions the advertising. You have the agency who creates the advert, and the marketer signs of what they've created. And then you have what is known as a, a media placement house who places the advertising in the media. That's a very simplistic explanation, but like I've said, this is not my area of expertise. Thank you, Ms. Gale. Um, would now, I would like to go to the presentation that was made by Priceless yesterday. It highlighted in its, uh, in its presentation that the membership to the ARB is voluntary, which you have confirmed. Sorry about that. Um, in the priceless uh, presentation, it was highlighted that the membership to the ARB is voluntary. For instance, if um, one does not want uh, to market their marketing content, it can amend it by withdrawal. So um, what is your take on this? And what are the checks and balances in place to ensure compliance of, uh, and and, and withdrawal of such. It's absolutely true. Membership is 
voluntary, and that does create some challenges. I think what's important to remember is that we are binding on broadcasters in terms of the Electronic Communications Act. So if you want to have an ad on TV or the radio, the fact that you're not a member of the ARB has no impact because we will make a decision for the guidance of our members and for the guidance of the broadcasters. And if you do not listen to us, the broadcasters can lose their license if they don't comply with the decision. So when it comes to TV and radio advertising, our teeth are very sharp. And what that means is you can... You can escape being bound by us when you do below-the-line advertising, when you advertise on your website um, and put a poster up on a street pole. But the moment you want to become a serious player, you find yourselves under our jurisdiction. That being said, this is an issue. Not everyone is a member, and we live in a country where not everyone is driven by ethics because uh, we, we have a lot of marketers who are not members but nonetheless comply because they know that it is the right thing to do. Many of the large marketers never argue about our decisions even though they are not members. But we have these rogue marketers and we are constantly looking for ways that we can improve that situation and that is one of the things that may come out of this commission. One of the suggestions I have made to government in the white paper on audiovisual, and I never get the full title of it all right, um, but there are, there are hearings on that at the moment, and I have suggested that there should, be, um, there should be a requirement that to place advertising in broadcast media, you should be able to show that you are a member of the ARB, which would widen our scope. There are many other ways um, that we can widen our scope, and we are constantly looking at that. But I would like to say that is something that perhaps the Commission will come up with a creative way without losing the self-regulatory aspect mm -hmm. of the ARB that we can look at. It was also highlighted in, in the priceless presentation that there's no specific membership fee that is levied by the ARB and that the ARB is not transparent. What is your comment on that? Okay. There is no membership fee because there is no membership fee. You don't have to pay a membership fee. So that is very transparent to me. Um, but And the reason we do not have a membership fee is because we don't want to discourage members. We want everybody to become a member. What they might have been talking about was our funding system. Our funding system is separate from membership. So... Members do not have to fund us, and funders do not have to be members. We are funded by members of the marketing industry. It is not transparent in that, or, or I don't want to say it's not transparent because that is not true. Um, it, is, it is not open because we don't have set fees. We go to marketers and we say, here is what we do for the industry. We would like you to pay us 0,1% of your ad spend. We would like you to think about how important self-regulation is to you. But whatever you can pay us, that's fine, because nothing is worse than something. So we have marketers who come in at different levels where they are comfortable. It is not the best funding system in the world because of these problems, because you don't know what your buddy is paying, because we know where the money is coming from, which is not ideal. There are a number of systems around the world, the main ones being a levy system, a membership system, or what we have, a direct funding system. A membership system would be better. A levy system would be better. But the reality is, what does the South African marketer have an appetite for? And that is the direct funding system. And as a result, we have taken the ARB from the history of an organization with six million rand debt through bad management of their funding to an organization with four million rand in the bank to safeguard us against future challenges in our funding and to safeguard us against the litigious environment that we're in. Please, I ask anyone who wishes to, to email info at arb.org.za and come to our AGM, which is on Tuesday, 
And at our AGM, we will be transparent about our figures and we will provide our full financials to anybody who requests them. In terms of your procedural guide, Article 14, it states that um, you order a withdrawal of the advertisement. You direct the advertiser in a breach of the court to submit the proposed amendment of the original advertisement uh, to the relevant ARB ruling and to the AAC advisory uh, service for a pre-publication service. Is this sort of sanction levy truly severe as it should be? Okay, so that sanction is only applied in a situation where we have an advertiser who is not listening to us and is not getting it right. So it would never be a sanction of the first um, order. It would only be a sanction that is applied when we see that they are not listening or when they're constantly making the same mistake. And clearly there is a need for some education around their advertising. And then that is given to the, they have to submit it to the ACA for pre-clearance advice. So, um, they have to pay for that. They have to change anything they've already done, which can be a very expensive exercise. I think, you know, I think there's this idea that we should be imposing massive fines, and it would it would be lovely for us if we could impose massive fines because then we wouldn't need a funding system. We'd have massive fines as our funding system, but we're not about punishment. We're about protecting the consumer. So when the problem is that the, the advertiser is not understanding the rules properly, then the correct remedy is to help them understand the rules properly, not to punish them, but to help them learn so that the consumer is protected. So could you elaborate on the factors that you would consider when implementing the sanctions, please? We would look, um, and it's, it's hard for me to elaborate, first of all, because it's actually been a long time since we have imposed one of these sanctions. In fact, I would say, I think I am correct in saying the ARB itself has never used the sanction. And part of that is because of the, the membership situation. We can obviously only sanction a member. You can't sanction a non-member because a non-member is not bound by the code. When it comes to a non-member, we go to the members and say, please stop accepting this advertisement. Um, but, but the factors that would come into play would be how severe was the original breach? Um, it would be how many, how, have they listened or haven't they listened and how many times and in what nature have they breached our decision? So, so we have a lot of breach decisions where, you know, in this world of digital online, when you remove an ad, it's quite hard. Um, so we have a lot of breach decisions where the one company has complained against the other company and there's been a decision and then they find that if you click on this YouTube channel and go down this rabbit hole and you find it, you'll eventually find the ad. And the other company will come back and say, I'm sorry, we didn't realize, we've removed it now. That's not something we're going to issue a harsh sanction for because that is a genuine error that in the, in the nature of online advertising, you can't pick it all up. So we would look at the nature of that breach. If they went out and took a full-page ad in the newspaper in breach of our decision, that would be the sort of thing where we'd have to look at sanctions. The sanctions involve that pre-clearance. It also involves an adverse publicity statement if they continue not to listen to us, where they have to pay for a adverse publicity statement that we draft and that we place in the media according to whatever the, because this will normally be done by one of the appeal committees, whatever the appeal committee says it must be. Um, if they don't pay for that, then we can issue, again I remind you to members, a blanket ad alert that says that the media will not accept any of their advertising, not just that bad ad, any of their advertising. Back in the day of the ASA, before the issue of non-membership became something that, that advertisers raised, this was a very effective sanction because it meant that, for example, it was used against teasers. 
um, when they were using un unacceptably offensive advertising. They refused to comply. We issued an ad alert saying, please pull all their advertising. And suddenly, they were ready to listen to us because they couldn't advertise anywhere. It only works when we've got all the media as advertisers, as members, which at the moment we don't. We're working on it. And it only works if the advertiser is a member. We are a self-regulatory body. <coughs> we are subject to limitations as a self-regulatory body. And that is why I call on the Commission to help us find ways that we can increase that enforcement and bring all advertisers into an ethical sphere where they're protecting consumers. So in terms of the withdrawal of the advert, what is the time frame upon withdrawal of that? It is set out in Section 15 of the procedural guide, I want to say, possibly Section 14. Um, for it, it, it basically depends on the type of media. So it will be immediately, always you have to action it immediately. But immediately as deadlines permit. So if it's on your website, you can pull it by this evening because that's easy. If it's a television commercial, the station has certain deadlines that they require you to give them notice that they're pulling, you're pulling that commercial. If it's beg your pardon, a magazine, remember back when we had magazines, then it's a much longer deadline. It's much harder to withdraw. If it's a pamphlet, it's very difficult because the pamphlet is out there already. We ask you that when you print the new, that you stop giving out the old pamphlet and the new one, you fix it. If it is packaging, then we give you three months. And the three months for packaging means not that the, all the packaging must be off shelf. It means that no new packaging with the misleading claim or the offensive image or whatever the problem was must, be, must leave the warehouses after that three months. One has to be realistic in what the advertiser can pull off because they are subject to these deadlines. But what we always look at when we look at a breach is we ask them to show us what action did they take immediately in order to make sure that the advertising was pulled as quickly as possible? Like I said, we're about consumer protection. And that fast pulling of the ad is core to consumer protection. So normally, a television commercial, within three days of the ruling going out, that will be pulled. Just going back to the presentation of Priceless yesterday. So if membership is negotiated and is attached to a monetary value, can the ARB be regarded as an independent Sorry, body? Sorry, I'm not hearing you. I do so, sir. If membership is negotiated and is attached is an attachment of a monetary value to it. Can the ARB be regarded as an independent body? Sorry? If membership is negotiated yes. and there's an attachment of a monetary value to it, can the ARB then be regarded as an independent body? You know, it, it's, a difficult, it's a difficult one. Um, it's something we could explore. Um, it's, our, our biggest thing is that, that we don't want to create a barrier to membership. We don't want to do anything that would discourage a marketer from being a member. So we don't want to attach a monetary value. We don't want to, you know, and also we, we have enforcement issues. The moment we start attaching monetary values to things, so having a fine or, ha or anything like that, they're going, we, we're going to lose members. Um, so I don't know if I'm answering the question properly, other, but you have made me think. Um, the other aspect is that w when one company lodges a complaint against another company, we do charge a fee. So when you use our, our um, processes in that way, that is something that they pay for. Um, member funders pay less than non-funders for that, but they pay, I, th I think, um, 
that the current filing fees are, it's if you're a funder of the ARB, it's 10,000 Rand to lodge a complaint against your competitor. And if you're not a funder of the ARB, it's 25,000 Rand to lodge a complaint against your competitor. Are those fees clearly stated in your procedural guide? On our website. Um, they're not in the procedural guide because obviously they change. Um, so the, the procedural guide allows for the charging of fees, but because you, you change with time, you know, the fee that you paid 25 years ago is not the fee that you pay today. Um, the amount is not specified in the, sp in the procedural guide, but it is specified on the website. We also have appeal fees, and the appeal fees are specified on the website. And we also, so when you lodge a complaint, for consumers it's free. Let me emphasize that. And, and because one of my missions here today is to make consumers more aware that they can use us as a problem-solving platform, it is free for consumers throughout the process. But for businesses lodging against another business, when you lodge your initial complaint, you also get a letter setting out all the appeal things telling you where to find the information on these fees. So that process is very transparent. Uh, we have not increased the fees in the time the ARB has been open. I now come to the conclusion of my questions and I'll just then give to my colleague to continue. So you have come to the conclusion of your questions. Are you through with your questions? Yes, Commissioner, on my okay. part, yes. Then, okay, uh, I suggest that uh, we take uh, a comfort break for exactly 10 minutes and we come and proceed.
again, uh, the witness, uh, you are reminded you are still under oath and uh, will now ask the second evidence leader to put his questions and questions of clarification to the witness. Uh, good morning again. Good morning. As I said, my name is Mlule again. I'm an advocate. Um, my co counsel here has done very well just laying out uh, the groundwork. So I've got, I don't have as much as she had to do. Uh, thank you. Oh. Yes, so I don't have uh, a lot to do. Um, but I want to start off with uh, your presentation and some of the issues you mentioned in your presentation. And I think I'll start at the, the court case. Could you just, as simply as you can, uh, explain to us what the issues there are? Okay. I, I'm going to try and do this simply, but it was quite complicated. So you, you may remember when I explained our process of appeal, I mentioned that a party can take a matter on review. And it would be the normal grounds of review that you have in law, that you think the judge was biased or you think he took evidence into account that he didn't take and shouldn't have taken into account and things like that. And we had a matter that involved imitation of packaging. It was one soap imitating another soap's, allegedly imitating another soap's packaging. And it went through the directorate and the ASC, and it went on final appeal, and then they brought a review against the decision. When a review is brought, the ARB doesn't mind. We file a notice of intention to abide, which means we will do whatever the court says. And so long as our jurisdiction is not threatened, we can learn from what the court tells us about how that decision was made. And we've been through this process before, and it has been non-problematic before. So we filed a notice to abide, and the matter was heard. And then the judge raised, during the hearing of the matter, first she raised the question of whether or not the ARB should be considering imitation when there is a large overlap between imitation and passing off. And she questioned that. And we all went back. So now the ARB had to enter the fray. We all went back and we submitted argument on that. She then asked the parties to redraft their papers ab initio. And when the, when the applicant came back with new papers. I'm sorry uh, to interrupt. Uh, Ms. Smile, can you please ask that you please uh, oh. move just a little bit okay. Sorry. from the sign language interpreter so Sorry. that she can it's interpret. Oh. Yeah. Like so. And also oh, am I doing my hands? Am I doing my hands? hands? I'll hands. sit on them. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> this is the hardest thing I have ever been asked to do, not talk with my hands. <laughs> just, just, just a little bit, if you can. Maybe the Me music, or the mic. Yeah. Yes. Uh, move the chair that way. Yes. So. Thank you. Okay. You can't see them. <laughs> okay. Is, is the lady fine? Everyone happy? So everything is all right? Yes. Evidence Fabulous. leader, I know you were on the floor. Uh, okay. okay. Man, can you um, continue? Where was I? Okay, so, so the applicant went back and redrafted their papers. And in their papers, they raised the issue that they do not believe that the ARB should have jurisdiction over non-members. This is a matter that had previously been before the courts under the ASA in the Herbex matter. So we were very surprised that the court was revisiting the situation, but the court allowed it. We argued, and in the high court we lost on a number of bases. It's an interesting, if somewhat confusing, judgment, and we took it on appeal. Um, it was heard by the Supreme Court of Appeal on the 1st of March, as I said, and our perception is that the court was receptive to what we were explaining and that we will be successful. I hope. I hope I'm not cursing myself by saying this in public. <laughs> were the parties in the, in the case, the two soap companies, mm, I'm, I'm assuming one of them was not a member? Or yes. So Bliss, who bought the application, were not a member. Colgate, who was the other party involved who had bought the original complaint, were a member, and then obviously we, were, we became 
an active party to the matter. And what are, let's say uh, in the SCA you are not successful, what are the consequences? Um, if we're successful, if you are not successful, if we're not successful, then the consequences of our reaching, it means we will not be able to make decisions about non-members. So first of all, will our members remain our members? Because now you can just go, ah, not a member. Um, second of all, how will we protect consumers against that misleading advertising being made by non-members? We have a number of solutions. We are launching a responsible advertiser campaign at our AGM on Tuesday, which calls on marketers to be bound by our jurisdiction whether, they are not, whether or not they are members. It calls on marketers to do the right thing. It, we have a responsible agency campaign that calls on agencies to bind their clients to our jurisdiction when they sign clients up. So that is one of the tools we are using to try to limit any damage by the court case. However, and I think I keep coming back to this, we're not the only self-regulatory organization in the world. And other countries have dealt with this exact challenge. And they have found ways around it. And we would have to explore those ways around it, whether we, we no longer publish our rulings, um, and it would depend on the, on the finding, because it would depend on exactly why they felt we were not constitutional. Is it the publication of our decisions that's the problem? Is it the instruction to our members that's the problem? But there are, there are many ways around it. We will not close. And I don't, I don't mean to belabor the point. Um, I just need to make an example. You're saying if an advertiser, let's say, I've mean, already mentioned clicks here. Let's say an, 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 a company uh, publishes an advert. That is, uh, there's a complaint that this advert is racist. Uh, and that company is not part of you. You're saying you wouldn't have, because of the, this court case, if you were to lose, you wouldn't have any jurisdiction over that uh, dispute. We wouldn't if we lose this. But like I said, we would look at creative ways to solve that problem. So perhaps what might happen then is the, and this is just a perhaps, this is not a plan, um, but one of the solutions would be that the media employ us to give an opinion on that advertising. And then they regard our opinion as binding on them because they, as, as you would regard any legal opinion as binding on you as a business when you've asked for it. So that would be one way that we, we offer our services in terms of furnishing an opinion. Is it going to be a good outcome if we lose for the consumer? No, it's not. It's going to be a disaster for the consumer. And we are hoping that the court has seen that and we think that the court has seen that. It seems from the reading of your, I think, in your submission, it seems that, and you can correct me if I'm wrong here, um, it seems that the High Court was of the view that even if um, a company is not a member under you, that it, will, it would somehow be a member of some other body, and because of that, it would be able to be held accountable. So this is, there were several misconceptions, I feel, that the, that the court labored under. The first was that our membership is enormously far-reaching, that it's almost impossible to escape the tentacles of our vast membership. That is not true. Um, our membership is fairly limited. This, the second misconception was that there are lots and lots of organizations that consumers can go to for help if they are misled by advertising or if they see racial discrimination in advertising or whatever the other problem is. And they talked about things like the Consumer Goods Ombud. They talked about the National Consumer Commission. And with all of those organizations, there is something that can be done for the consumer, but it's not as wide as what we can do. So for example, the Consumer Goods Ombud only deals with members it only mediates a solution, and if they don't reach a happy mediation, there's nothing that they can do. Um, the National Consumer Commission, I've talked a lot about the need for speed in the regulation of advertising. If you have a commission that's going to have an eight-month inquiry into a problem, that's great for the big picture, like this commission. It's, it's meaningful for the big picture. It's not meaningful for the specific ad, because that ad has run 
it's over, it's finished by the time that commission can make a decision about that ad. What we offer is that fast relief to the consumer. And the other thing is I don't believe that there are many organisations that are ac as accessible to the consumer and from what I have heard that get the response that we give the consumer. Every single person who complains to us gets a response for us, from us. The response might be, we're not prepared to take this further for the following reasons, but they will get a response from us. It seems then, from what you've said, that there's a, a need in the industry for one body that would regulate everyone. I believe we are that body. I believe there's not a need because I believe we are here. What there is a need for is better enforcement processes and whether that comes from an act of parliament or comes from a different membership structure or comes from the court case. Um, th there is a need for us to find a way that advertisers cannot get away with being rogue advertisers. Um, but I believe, and I suppose I have to believe it because it is at the moment my life's work, um, that we are the correct body and that we do an excellent job. You, are you saying you are the appropriate body, we are not the that appropriate you are body. the body? That, that, that we are an appropriate body, an yes. appropriate body. We are an yes. appropriate body. I'm not in saying this, and I please can I be clear. The Consumer good on, Goods Ombud does important work that we cannot do. So, for example, if you want the thing, if you saw the thing advertised and you want the thing, they can get you the thing. We can't get you the thing. Um, the National Consumer Commission does important work. All of these bodies do important work. We don't cancel each other out. We all do important work. Is, and I'm again tying it up to your presentation. Is there, you said you're a voluntary body. If you're the appropriate body, is there a way of changing that? And how, how does that look, like changing the voluntariness? How do we ensure that, how could we force everyone to be part of you? Was, but not, no, not we, how could you do it? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's you. <laughs> um, um, it's a difficult question, and then there are a number of solutions. It would probably require legislation. So it would require legislation enforcing self-regulation, so a co-regulation model. So, for example, one could have an, one could have an ARB Act, um, and an ARB Act would say all marketers are bound by the self-regulatory model, and if you are not, you have to answer to court or to the Competition Commission or to something like that. Um, I think, for me, that would be the neatest solution, but I also, you know, it's a big dream, it's a big ask mm. to ask for an ARB, um, an ARB Act. And we don't want, so, so one of the wonderful things about the ARB is for example, I showed you how we changed our clause on discrimination. We didn't have to take three years to do that. We did it through industry consultation, and we did it quickly because it was urgent. So we have to ensure that we don't lose that ability to change the code quickly to reflect the changing world um, in, if we do ever become, uh, become the topic of legislation. We don't want the code to become like a regulation where you have to have a white paper and then have a draft and then have it open for a certain amount of time, et cetera, et cetera. We need that speed. And since we are on this comparative analysis between you and other bodies, um, could you just explain to us uh, simply, hierarchy-wise or just where, where do the other bodies sit? So we're looking at ICASA, uh, MASA. Could you just draw a picture for us? It's difficult because we don't form part of the same hierarchy and it will depend on the situation how we, how we um, sit in relation to each other. ICASA is obviously the broadcasting regulator and they are a creature of statute. But ICASA has allowed that advertising regulation can happen by the self-regulator. Um, they recognize the efficiency of it and ICASA allow that that's how so advertising self-regulation. So we, we sit below ICASA in a hierarchical structure. We do not report to ICASA. We are a self-regulatory body. We are not created by ICASA. 
And then in terms of MASA and um, ACA and IAB, they are our members for the purposes of this conversation. So for the purposes of this conversation, you would draw an organogram, put your hands away, um, you would draw an organogram with the ARB on the top and the members below. But for the for the purposes of another conversation, it would be a different it would be a different organogram because we all have different jurisdictions. We have all have different aims. Master, for example, while having self regulation is an important concern of theirs, they also deal with certifying marketers and lobbying government and different things that we don't deal with. Hypothetically, um, Ikasa could absorb all of you in this is in this new legislation that you uh, were talking about. Are we talking about it? <laughs> Wonderful. It would be... Yeah. Wh whatever body is then created by the merger of all of you under or within ICASA, that new organization would be the appropriate body. I would be loath to seeing us limited by the red tape that limits a governmental organization. I think that is always where my, my fear comes in. Um, so, so yes, we could fall under CASA in, you know, in terms of that sort of structure. And, and I'm talking off my cuff here. So I'm, I ha you know, if we really did this, I would get lots and lots of learned legal opinion before putting forth exactly what our position would be. But my gut feeling is it has to be something that preserves the essential self-regulatory nature of self-regulation. Mm. But certainly, certainly ACASA is a relevant organization to how we would manage it. And, and as it is, we do in some senses fall under ACASA. This then raises the two questions about to wh how are you held accountable and by whom? Okay. Um, yes. Okay. Our industry. Uh, we report to our industry. Our industry holds us accountable through the board and the board has got all our members have representatives on the board. So I report as the CEO to the board. Um, and, and the board holds us accountable. I often, when I talk about the role of the ARB, say we are a servant of the industry. We, are for, we, we administer the code on behalf of the industry and we are reportable to the industry. Um, and believe me, they do hold us accountable. Um, I'm assuming since you had said um, that you were are, you are created by the industry, that your board is made up of industry players and then they are a higher the administrative staff? Well, th no. Um, so, so I'm the executive head as the CEO. Um, I do the hiring and the et cetera. On the appeal committees, it is members, members um, nominate people to sit on the appeal committees. And the chairs of the appeal committees are confirmed by the board and decided by the board. I would I would seek out, if we needed a new chair of a committee, I would seek out available suitable people and I would put it to the board and the board would decide. Um, have I answered the question? <laughs> yes, you have. Uh, the other side to it then, and I know you explored this with my uh, co counsel but I just want to focus on a different aspect of it, which is the, the sanctions part, right? How you hold your members accountable. If you impose a particular sanction on one of your members, and that member ignores the sanction, what else can you do? So and that would lead to that situation where we would issue a blanket ad alert. There would be a number of steps before that, but we would end up issuing a blanket ad alert where we would tell broadcasters and other media to not accept any advertising from that particular advertiser. How effective would it be with the other media who are not broadcasters? I'm not sure. We haven't tried it in recent years. and. The difference between the ARB and the ASA is that the ASA had more media members. Um, so, it, it's a, and what, what would I do if I was a marketer subject to that sort of sanction? I'd stop being a member. You know, it's, uh, there is that obvious loophole. Um, and we, we can't, self-regulation is only ever going to be 
finite in its powers. And in a perfect world, what happens is if you do not submit to the self-regulator, then there is a consequence that flows from government or from a particular department. So ideally, if you have a food advertisement that is in some way harmful and you are not listening to the ARB, the Department of Health should step in. If you have a... I'm trying to think of an example that would trigger another department, but you get my point. You know, particular departments are responsible for particular aspects of consumer safety, and it should be first stop is the self-regulator, but second stop is government. So essentially, uh, you impose a sanction on me, I disagree with the sanction, I can just uh, stop being your member. And broadcasters would be... Broadcasters would still be bound. Would still be bound. Yeah. Broadcasters would still be bound. Broadcasters would still not accept your advertising. Would they be bound even though I'm not a member? Even though you're There's not a member? Because they are bound, bound. to Section 55 of the Electronic Communications ah. Act. So that is the real power. But you know, the danger is not advertisers who are advertising on broadcast media. The danger is advertisers who are only advertising on their own websites in newspapers to some extent, although we have a large degree of cooperation from the newspapers. Um, but, but that's the danger. The ones who are using TV and radio, and let's be honest, that's where the, the potential to do the most harm lies because that reaches the most people. Um, but those are still accountable. Social media? Social media is a very difficult one. We make decisions about social media uh, because it falls with, within our definition of advertising. 90% of the time, it will be an ethical advertiser who listens to us and complies with the decision. But you have the rogue advertisers. Uh, we, we have a rule that all influencers should be using hashtag ad. We all know that that's not happening across the board. And, uh, and I mean, uh, uh, ironically, it's, it's very much under the spotlight at the moment um, because of the Hello Darling issue, um, this, this thing that, that, hashtag, that influencers should be using hashtags to identify their advertising. We can only act if we get a complaint. And this is not something we're getting complaints about. Again, consumers know your powers. You can complain to us. I just need to make an illustration here. So if uh, an institution pays an influencer to market their product, an influencer was followed by probably, let's say, 5 million people, and that influencer advertises the product, but in a way that would be racist, for instance, a complaint is raised, are you saying you wouldn't have any... We would make a decision, unless the court says in a few months we can't, but we would make a decision. We would not call on the influencer to account for what they're doing. We would call on the marketer that employed the influencer to account for what that influencer is doing. Because remember, again, if the influencer sells the product, it's the marketer who makes the money. So if the influencer is behaving in an unacceptable way, the marketer must account for why they are allowing their advertising media. That's what the influencer is. It's a type of media to do that. Um, we do find we haven't had a lot of cases we do find some that what has sometimes happened is that the influencer has just gone off piste and is doing their own thing, um, and then they will quickly be reined in by the marketer. Again, we're not in the business of punishing. We're in the business of protecting. However, when it comes to influencers, we have seen that when we publish a decision that highlights the behavior of a particular influencer, it's not great for the influencer. This then leads me to the question about your complaints mechanism. Uh, again, I want to focus on different aspects to it because you've dealt with it. How accessible is your complaints mechanism to people who might not have uh, technology? That is a problem. Um, and it, it has been all over the world it's a problem. Um, how do you weigh up access to complaints against the need to have the complaint reduced to writing so that proper audi altrum can occur, so that the advertiser can answer the case that's between them. The danger, through the years, there's always been discussion of should we take a phone complaint? But what if I misunderstand your complaint on the phone? 
and we go through the whole process and at the end of it you go, that's not what I meant. So that's why we ask you to reduce it to writing. I do think there is an issue, as with so much in this world, that if you don't have access to a computer and you don't have access to our online form or email, you have a problem. The same goes for registering for vaccinations. The same goes for so many booking your, booking your car license. You know, it's not an A or B problem. It's a modern world versus poverty and access to information problem. Um, we would accept a, a written hand-delivered complaint. It hasn't happened for many a long year, but we would accept it as long as it's reduced to writing. In your definition of discrimination, um, I'll just read it quickly. Advertising where a person or group is negatively stereotyped or portrayed in a manner that exploits or demeans or restricts and entrenches their role in society. Surely you'd want people who are being negatively stereotyped who are poor Sorry? to be able... Surely you would want people who are negatively stereotyped, for instance, and who are poor living in villages across South Africa. You'd want those people to be able to access you. Absolutely. Absolutely. And if, if, if there is a creative solution to that problem that comes out of this hearing, we would be extremely open to it. Bearing in mind, we have limited, limited resources. So to give you an idea of our limitations, I have four full-time staff, including myself. I don't have a vast building full of call center people able to take down complaints from people. I have a tiny little staff. So I have to solve problems in a way, because our budget is small. Um, I have to solve problems in a way that takes account for that. I would love to see a creative solution to that. I absolutely believe what, what, you are, what you are implicitly saying, that the people who need our protection most are maybe the people who are not able to access us, and that is a problem. And I would love to look at creative solutions for that. And I would invite anybody, anybody listening, any who has a creative solution to that, please, our, our email addresses are on our website. Okay, now, <laughs> um, you've got to use the website to, to get the creative solution to us. But we really, our, our doors and our ears are always open to different ways of doing things. Just exploring here with you and glad you said you're a lawyer, but would you, don't you would that not fall uh, within the definition of discrimination? Sorry? Your inability or refusal, d depending on how you see it, um, to create mechanisms that enable poor people to make complaints to you, would that not fall within the definition of discrimination? It, I mean, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a problem. It's, you're highlighting a real problem. Um, that, but I also have, you know, how do we get over that requirement that we need the complaint in writing and we need it to be the complaint as expressed by the complainant? It's, it's a vicious circle. Um, it's a vicious circle. A complainant could probably call uh, a toll-free number that you guys have or that you would create. Um, someone from the other side would answer and then make a, an appropriate follow-up. So you, because you have the telephone lines, you'd call back and then take a detailed statement from that person. That's, the that's one of the issues. We, we could try that. We would, we would need financing to do that. Toll-free lines with people waiting on the other end to take down statements um, is expensive. And we, we at the, as we stand, do not have the resources to do that. But it certainly would be something we could do. The danger is always, and you have to understand, we are... We operate in a highly litigious environment. The danger would be you take that statement down slightly wrong and you open yourself to litigation. But I don't think that that's an insurmountable danger. We could build checks and balances into the system. We could send the complainant a written version of their complaint and have them confirm that they are happy with it. We could do things like that. It's, it's a, it, at, the, at this point, it would be a financial challenge. Um, and again, I, I, I'm, I'm open to any funding that the Commission feels it can throw our way um, in order to set up something like this, but, but that is a solution. There was the ASA to try and introduce an SMS line where it would be one of those kind of um, robocall type, 
you send an SMS and then you get a question and you pick one, two, three, four, and then you get the next SMS and you lodge the complaint. They the ASA spent a great deal of money setting up that system. Not one consumer used it. Well, that's not, in a way that then takes all your perceived problem because when we are, when we started this conversation you are afraid of a deluge of calls uh, that you'd be unable to follow up on but based on what you're saying to me is that actually there w might not be that many calls that one of the four people you have who, under, who are currently in your staff members would be able to handle one or two of the calls that could come up well I, it, so I don't know I don't know how I don't know how much it would have a reaction so that's it so I like to believe I, th I think an SMS system was not ideal um, you've got to have data to do that. You've got to be fairly literate to do it because you're still putting things in writing. You know, you've got to. It, it was. I, I don't know for sure. I think it was English medium only. Um, so there are all those barriers to entry. I would love to think that if we had a toll-free line, we would, we would market it properly. We would make people aware of it, and we would get more complaints. So I don't know. I d you, it might be that one of my four people could handle the one phone call that came through every four months without breaking a sweat. Or it might be that the 3,000 calls that came through every day would break my four people into shivering wrecks. Um, I don't know. It's difficult. And, and it's obviously something I could explore. Internationally, this is not done. Um, internationally, it's done in writing. But obviously, internationally, they're dealing with a different, a different population and a different, different challenges. Um, but I could explore the different solutions to this. Of the, you, you gave us stats regarding complaints you've received. Um, <coughs> how many would you say from those complaints, how many would you say have come from the public, the general public? I don't have exact stats because I have to, and you will see I did, I did in fact say this in my submission, our, because we are a fairly young organization with limited resources, our data collection is very subject to human error. And I do not off the top of my head have exact stats, but it would be guesstimating 98% come from the public. It's a very small amount that come business to business. Okay. In your um, suggestions or recommendations, there were three. Um, the one was on training. How much training currently has been done uh, for your members? So we offer our members training in different ways. We offer... Um, so, sorry. Sorry. Training in, in discrimination, discrimination, racism, yes. Okay. After the Clix Tresame incident, where we realized that perhaps people are not as aware of the code as they should be, we offered a training workshop to our entire industry. And as I indicated, only one agency took us up on it. And we offered, we did that training for that agency. I, I want to say, I think another agency, I think another agency later requested it, and we did bespoke training for them. Um, but, th but you know, you, you can take a horse to the water, but you can't make a drink. We can offer the training, but we can't compel anyone to do the training. And what we found when we offered the training initially was that the take-up was very low. And as I speculated, maybe everybody thinks they're not the problem. Um, other people are the problem. But it's worrying. It disappointed me terribly. So even with your members, only one person came? Not one person, one, one agency. One agency came, came, sorry. Which again, I mean, I, we've already explored this. Um, the point there is really about effectiveness and how effective are you? The, uh, well, that is, the point is how receptive is the industry to being trained? And we, we are not a forceful we, we have no powers um, in terms of we can't force you to. We can't say you will not be allowed to place advertising if you do not come to our training. Um, so we, we reliant on a voluntary attendance at industry training. And I think, I think the thing that needs to be 
done here is that industry needs to be aware of the need for the training. We can offer the training. We can't force anybody to come. Um, and we believe we offer excellent training, and especially the training around around the content of the code and the, the, the thing that I've talked about, that if you know what the rules are, you're empowered. And I think we know that in every aspect of society. If a person knows the rules, they're empowered by those rules. So it's, it's also why I call on the Commission to partner with us. If the Human Rights Commission says you should do this training, that's a little bit more powerful than if the ARB say you should do this training. I call on the Commission to partner with us in this. Have you made the call to other industry regulators? Let's partner together in transforming the industry in running these trainings. Have so, you made the call? So the ACA and MASA um, were on board in the, in the initial conceptualization, and we are for 2022 looking forward at how we can offer more training in this and other areas. You know, one of our challenges is there are lots of troubling areas. The subject of this commission is one troubling area that represents 0,4% of our complaints. There's also training in misleading advertising, training in social media practice, etc. And we are looking with our members at how we can offer more meaningful training in those areas. And of course, mass, not everyone would fall within, they're also voluntary Sorry? institution. MASA and all of the others are also voluntary institutions, right? Um, yeah, they're all voluntary institutions. So even if you were to collaborate, uh, there'd still be some... There'll always be... Who don't unless, want to be trained. You know, there's always going to be someone who won't come to the training. That's the, and the reality is, the sad reality is, it will probably be the agency or the person or the marketer who most needs the training, who is the one that you will struggle to bring to the table. Because the moment you have an agency or an individual or a marketer who goes, racial discrimination is a problem, we need to go to that training. They're already halfway over the problem because they are already acknowledging the problem. It's those that are not acknowledging a problem who really need the training. Mm. How do you get someone who doesn't acknowledge a problem to attend training to fix the problem they won't acknowledge? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let me um, end it there with just the last one. If you were to rate yourself in terms of effectiveness in what you are purposed to do on a scale of 1 to 10, of course 10 being we are absolutely perfect and 1 being pathetic. Where would you put yourself on, on, on a scale? And I know I'm being naughty here, but I just want to know, do you, how effective do you think you are as an institution? I can't answer that simply. How, effectively, how effective are we in terms of the work we are able to do with our members and with ethical advertisers who buy into our system in terms of the quality of decisions we, we issue, in terms of the um, process we follow in legality? 10 out of 10. How effective are we in the bigger picture, given that we are a self-regulatory organization, given that there are people who will not never listen to us, given that we have all the restrictions of a self-regulatory system, and we do not have a co-regulatory system where government is backing us in any way, shape, or form? Um, I would give us... So I'm constantly amazed by how effective we are, despite those, despite those challenges. I would give us a six and a half. Very specific. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, just sorry, l l very last one. You said you have four staff members. So you're the f uh, there's five of you, right? Th that's full-time staff full -time members. Staff. We, do, we do use independent contractors for certain aspects of our work. And what's the racial and gender makeup of all of these people? Okay, I'm a white female. We have one white male, we have one black female, and we have one Indian female. However, if you look wider, um, as I have mentioned, the chair of our appeals committee is a black male, the chair of our final appeals committee is a black male, and then we use a panel of external adjudicators to assist with the drafting and making of decisions. I sign them all off, um, the, the buck stops with me, 
but we, we do use external adjudicators to assist us with making those decisions. And what we try very much to do there is to fit the adjudicator to the decision. I do not want a complaint about racial discrimination going to a white man for the initial decision. We've, we, we have enough of white men's voices. We don't need white men's voices on the issue of racial discrimination. I do not want a complaint about discrimination of Hindus going to somebody with no sensitivity to religion. It's hard for me to find an exact match and go, I've got a Hindu person, I've got a Muslim person, I've got a Jewish person, I've got an atheist person, and match my complaints to the person. But we try in so far as we can to do that and to be really sensitive to the fact of who is making the decision around different issues. It's easy to make a decision about whether or not the chicken was overpriced. <laughs> it's hard to make a decision about racial discrimination. Thank you. <sighs> Thank you very much, uh, evidence leader. We shall now proceed to ask the members of the panel to ask questions and questions of clarification to the witness. Sorry, I'll start first with uh, Professor Majongi. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, good morning once again. Uh, <clears throat> the work that you and your team are doing is very, very important. Thank you. Uh, and your input is central to this inquiry. So, so I know you've been on stand for two hours, but just bear with us for a few I more minutes, please. I can bear with you happily. I want to start with uh, uh, follow-up questions, uh, two follow-up questions. The first one is whether you will agree that you are almost an elitist institution in a sense that, you know, you don't allow SMS, you know, complaints. You don't allow people to send letters by PO box. <laughs> so this is accessibility issue, which is very, very serious. But there's another side to it, which is that, you know, out of in a country with 11 official languages, <coughs> from your website at least, you only operate in English, right? Your rulings are in English, even though advertisements are in all manner of languages. What does that tell us about the institution, I wonder? I, I, I've got two questions. Uh, I've got four questions, I'll ask two questions. All right. <laughs> yeah, <coughs> I've, got two, I've got four questions, I'll ask two questions, and then you'll come uh, back with... Uh, two other questions. I was going to ask about the makeup of your of your team, but uh, th that has already been asked. So, thirty six about thirty six fun, uh, funders uh, from your website, people who are funding you. I saw about thirty six. Is it what is a special status? Is there any special status uh, that funders have? Uh, can you say more about their their their? If there are any special status? Secondly, and 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 I know you don't have the exact figures. Of the advertising sector in South Africa, would you say your membership is 20%, 30% of the sector? If you have to guess, you know, you said not everyone is a member of ARB. I'm putting you on the spot to, to guesstimate, you know, the percentage of members. I'm asking for not only the reach of your influence, but I'm also asking, this question is also about how respected are you by the industry that people are voluntarily becoming your members? So, so tell me about the funders first, and then secondly, tell me about the percentage of the sector. And as I said, uh, we know that you don't have the exact figures. Uh, uh, yeah, let's start there, please, with those two questions. Difficult. Um, so, so I just want to first point out, we accept complaints in any language. Um, if the complaint is not in English, we will source an appropriate translator and have the complaint translated. Um, perhaps we do not communicate that well enough. We also accept complaints against advertising in any language. And again, we will source an appropriate translator if we do not have in-house skills um, in that particular language. And again, I would also then source an external adjudicator who is fluent in the nuances of that language, because language is very nuanced, and you, you have to, you, you can't have a second language 
um, a poor second language speaker trying to assess advertising in a particular language. So we would handle that very carefully. I think your point is very important there. Are we communicating that well enough? And I think the answer is probably no. And that is something I am going to take out of this meeting and make clearer in our communications. Um, the status of funders in terms of whether they have a special status. They have a special status in that if they want to lodge a complaint against another, um, another business, they pay lower filing fees. They do not have a special status in that they have no preference when it comes to decision making. We will make a decision against a funder as easily as we will make a decision against a non-funder. It's a difficult one because I know that that is true because I know that I am the person in charge of making sure that that is true and I know that I'm an absolutely ethical person. However, our funding system is not ideal because in an ideal funding system, we would not know exactly where the money came from. So there would be no potential for accusa accusations of favoritism. The levy system, which is what the old, old system was, the money was paid as a levy on advertising, it went into a fund, and the fund paid for self-regulation, and the fund, sorry, and the fund paid for um, market research. And that was perfect, because then the regulator did not know exactly who was paying what money. We have not been able to re-establish that system. We, there are a number of, of problems with that, and I can go into the detail of why it has been impossible to re-establish that system, but we have not been able to. It's a better system. I will never de deny that our funding system, that, uh, that our funding system works as a constant source of amazement to me. And it has this problem that we know who's paying us. However, when I meet with funders, with potential funders, I make it very clear in every meeting, you are not buying a decision when you fund us. If you look at our decisions against funders and non-funders, you will see that the decisions bear me out on that. We, we rule against funders. We have had one incident where I personally believe they funded us because they thought they were going to get a decision in their favor, and when they didn't, they stopped funding us. On the whole, marketers understand that they are not buying the decision. Um, okay, what percentage? I really, I, w I w would like to come back. I would have to do more research because first of all, the question is influenced by, are we talking about ad spend or are we talking about number of marketers? So there are hundreds of thousands of small businesses and marketers and then we are represented by 2%, maybe. Um, but if we look at ad spend, then it becomes a different equation. And I'd, I, I would love to answer you because I want to answer. It would be such a guesstimate that I'd be out of my depth. You can always supplement. Possibly okay. Marsa will be in a better position okay. to give you a better idea of of that. I'm not sure, but possibly Marsa would be in a better position to answer that question, and I know Marsa are, are going <laughs> to be here tomorrow, I think. Two last questions. L let's come to your suggestion about uh, the state helping you with enforcement. You can't have it both ways. You can't, you know, still want to hold on to self-regulation but on the other hand, you want the state to help you have a bite and teeth. You spoke of the concept of co-regulation. How would that work? How would that work? So co-regulation would work, I think, as, a, as I propose with the idea, for example, either of an ARB statute or of a, another statute that recognizes the ARB, um, where the powers of the ARB are recognized, um, where there is an enforcement process, whether it is through the courts, that if you aren't listening to the ARB, the matter falls to the courts, or the ARB can use the courts to enforce the process, um, which is another thing that we, we can look at exploring depending how the court case goes. Um, what, when, I, when I talk about preserving self-regulation, what I'm talking about is preserving that ability 
to act quickly and change the rules quickly. Because I think one of the biggest problems when it comes to advertising regulation is if you are subject to the same restrictions that a law or a regulation is subject to, you can't change fast enough. Because advertising problems raise their heads, they're there for a few months, and then they disappear. You need to be able to react to that. So what I would be looking for is co-regulation either in forms of a statute or a section to a statute that recognizes the powers of the ARB, or a situation, so, so for example, we have talked about with the Competition Commission in relation to a very specific problem, the idea of saying to marketers in that particular problematic industry, go to the ARB, be bound by the ARB, but if you choose not to be bound by the ARB, you're going to answer to the Competition Commission. And obviously when you answer to the Competition Commission, you're answering with 10% of your turnover rather than just pulling an ad. So, so that's another form of co-regulation where, where there is a pressure put brought to bear on marketers to take part in the self-regulation system or else there is a more draconian system that is waiting for you if you don't want to be part of an ethical self-regulatory system. Self-regulation, so with co-regulation, you would still have independence in who appoints the CEO, the board of directors, you still have the funders, yes. you still have your appeal system, so you still be independent except that there will be statute. Absolutely. Why, why will, you know, other, why will other agencies not form their own body and say, government, why do you recognize the ARB and not us? They Could you contemplate such a, such a they scenario? They might well. Yeah. They might well put it. Should we, should we table that proposal? We might well. There are no other bodies that I'm aware yes. of. Mm -hmm. There's nobody else who yeah. I think wants to do the very hard work that we do. Mm. Um, but it could happen, and then we would have to deal with that proposal um, mm. when it arose. But, but what you say exactly, that is ideal co-regulation. Mm. That is what we would love to see. Um, and, and I think it would be very exciting to see a move towards it. My last question, Chair. Let's make sure that we are on the same page about the purpose of this inquiry and whether you believe that there's a problem. So you say, you uh, not that you don't think there's a problem, you say there were only three complaints uh, last year. I've got three questions, I've got two questions there. One is why you didn't include, and, and you mentioned, you list, those complaints uh, against Kellogg's, mm -hmm. uh, Finnish, and Chigiligan, but that was a parody account. Why did you not list the Mangrele complaint, the one about racism is not a problem? Remember that one last year? Be so we'll come to, uh, 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 please answer that. Why, why you don't consider that to be a complaint against racism? Because the complaint was very clear that yeah. this board is indirect racism, very explicitly, the complaint said that. So yeah. I'm very interested in your understanding mm. of racism mm. yourself as a CEO. And then I come back to the definitions that you use. So you say the cliques, uh, the cliques advert was, a, was an error. It's a type of error caused by toth deafness and the, one of the solution is unconscious bias. And these two terms, unconscious bias and tone deafness, are suddenly new terms that we don't know where they're coming from. In a society, we have always used the terms racism, right? I want you to define for me the difference between unconscious racism, tone deafness, tone deafness, and racism, and racism. I'm, I'm asking this not because it's academic, because we are going towards a solution in terms of training. If your training is on unconscious bias, is it the same as a training on anti-racism, right? So, so I want to understand that in terms of, of, of your understanding of these issues yourself as a CEO. Uh, uh, and, and, and secondly, whether you think that should be, uh, when you say we should do research, your research, you, say, you suggest the research on uh, sensitivity, what was it called? Yeah, sensitivity handling and uh, uh, unconscious bias that you want to partner with, with the commission. Gail, I'm not convinced that you yourself 
are convinced that this inquiry is important, that racism is an issue, but what is a problem for you is, you know, errors are made because of tone death necks or complete ignorance. South Africa is a historically racist country. Absolutely. And to use concepts like unconscious bias and tone deafness, I suggest to you, is watering down the problem. Okay. Um, the first question about the racism is not a problem at. I absolutely agree. Why is it not in that list? And I think the reason we didn't pick it up when we were going through the lists is because the, we could not deal with that complaint because it falls out of our jurisdiction, because it is a um, it is an expression of a controversial opinion rather than an advertisement. So, uh, yeah, but I agree with you. It should have been in the report. That was an error on my half. I did, I did allow my four people to, to go through the stats for me and to bring me back the report of what we what we had, and I think they did not pick it up because it fell under the under the not within our jurisdiction finding rather than a this is a racist ad because we never made a call on the content of the ad because it fell in a particular, and there is a ruling. We did make a decision on it. Um, I have not read the ruling recently, but it was it was an expression of a controversial opinion, which is waters we do not wade into. It was not selling a product. It was not an advertisement in the in the um, traditional sense of advertising. And you know, I'm, I make and I hope that I'm coming across clearly here that I make no ap apologies for the fact that our powers are limited. We're about advertising, and we're about the content of advertising. Um, so that's the racism is not, but I, I agree with you. I should have reflected it in the report and I apologize to the commission that I did not. Um, secondly, I want to be very clear that I think that racism is a problem and that I think that racism in advertising is a problem. And I think that it is a problem that is far more subtle and far reaching and systemic than those complaints reflect. I think one gets complaints when you have something very overt, like the clicks matter. I think that racism is not an overt thing. Racism is a silent beast that lurks in communications in a subtle way. And that is what, why I believe we need to research how that is working, how that is happening. What I saw in one of the other submissions that you had yesterday, talking about the fact that an ad will show the white woman with a washing machine and the black woman with a hand wash. And we know that one of the answers the industry will give us is because that is the market um, and because there are economic realities to the market and they aim at their market. That's what the industry will tell you is the answer to that problem, that they aim at a specific market sector. Is that a good enough answer? I don't know. Is it a good enough answer to tell me why the woman is always doing the washing and never the man. Yes, it's true. In most households, women do the washing. Is that a good enough answer? I don't know. That's where we've got to do more research. That's where we've got to set lines of what we're expecting. Okay, let me talk about the unconscious bias and the tone deafness. I think as South Africans, and I speak as a white South African here, we, a, a, God, this is a terrible expression, a good, a good citizen, an aware citizen, a woke citizen, is aware of the potential for racism in all of us. We come from a very conflicted, difficult history, and we come into our present with that history on our backs. And a woke white South African is always checking themselves. They're always going, am I letting something, some assumption that I've made get in my way here? Am I... You know, we, we, we check ourselves. It's a constant process. Is everyone doing that? No. A lot of people have an unconscious bias working. That, so let's look at clicks. We have been told by European marketing, by shampoo manufacturers, by society at large, that there is a certain sort of hair called normal hair. And that that normal hair is a white woman's hair. Obviously, in South Africa, 
That is ludicrous. How can you in South Africa call normal hair a white woman's hair? Obviously it's wrong. But there's that unconscious bias where a person's not even questioning it. They're not even going. They're going, well, this is how shampoo's always worked. I'm going to write normal hair because that's what I've always understood. They're not going, I'm going to set out to make a racist ad. They're just not questioning what's going on in their unconsciousness. And it's difficult. It's, it's work. I think we're sitting here in a room for the Human Rights Commission. This is work we are all awake to. This is work in ourselves that we are all awake to. But I don't think we can assume that everybody is, and that's what I mean by unconscious bias. I mean that unacknowledged bias that people are not questioning in themselves that they don't even know they have because they're doing so little questioning. And it's across all sorts of things. Racism is what we're talking about here. Sexuality. Why does every ad have a mom and a dad? What's going on there? You know, there, there's so many different levels that you can ask. Religion. Why are we saying Happy Christmas to everybody? What's going on there? All these unconscious biases. And tone deafness is that, that failure. It's taking that failure to question to another level of not questioning what your words mean. Not questioning how do your words fall on your audience. When you say a white woman's hair is normal hair, how does that land on your majority black South African audience? Because you are deaf to the tone of what you are saying. And those are all things that we need to be conscious of, we need to be working on, we need to be fighting, we need to be training against. I think it is a given in this room. Racism is not simple. Racism is complex, racism is deep, Racism is something we have to be fighting on many different levels. And I think that's what I was trying to encapsulate in talking about unconscious bias, in talking about tone deafness, and in talking about racism. And please let nothing I've said communicate that I do not think racism is a problem. I think it's a problem in advertising. I do not think it's the problem that is the, the top of mind for the people who are complaining to us. They're worried about the price of those chickens. But that doesn't mean it's not one of the things that has to be dealt with if we're going to move forward as a country. Same goes for gender bias. Same, you know, all of, all of these issues where we're not interrogating ourselves are problems. Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you, Professor, uh, Commissioner Bayoni. Do you uh, have questions and questions for clarification to the witness? Yes, Chairperson, I do have. Okay, proceed. Hi, Kay. <laughs> you, you, you must pardon me if I become the victim of my own warning to say people should not use hands when I start using my hands in asking me questions. <laughs> let, let me start by what transpired from the questions you were asked by Professor Majingozi. And you keep on uh, repeating the necessity of ARB to have a, a statute, in other words, a legislation. My simple question is, have you considered maybe uh, initiating a private member's bill? It won't only be for ARB, but also with the uh, same institutions or organizations in the same line. Um, so, so this, this question of whether we should have a statute came up after we'd reformed the ARB and, you know, we started looking at, at the effect effectiveness of the ARB and how can, how can we um, deal with that and th the idea of having a statute. 
And then what happened is the court case kind of diverted us away from looking at different ways we could go about having that statute. We do have a very good relationship with the Department of Communications. Um, and I had started early talks with the Department of Communications about whether or not a statute would be an appropriate mechanism and whether the Department of Communications would like to look at that and carry it forward. Um, and w we had started those, and then the court case took the wind out of all our sails, and we needed that to be resolved before we, before we felt we could go forward with looking at a statute. So we would, depending on the outcome of the court case, because that will depend on how we need to deal with it um, and, and what the implications are, our next legal challenge will be to look at is that what our industry wants? Because that's obviously my first, my first um, <coughs> challenge, is I have to go back to my industry and say, here's what we're talking about, here's what we're thinking, here's the answer to a lot of our problems. Is that what you want? And then look at the different ways we could table it. Uh, when uh, the evidence leader, advocate Mlulegi Mahongo, was asking you questions, you repeatedly uh, stated against uh, either partnering with uh, uh, government uh, institutions because it came out clear when he was asking about the possibility of working with ICASA, Independent Communications of South Africa. And then also you repeated when you were asked by Professor Malingozi to say you are making a call to partner with the uh, Human Rights Commission. Will I be correct to say that you want to maintain independence? We want to maintain independence. The reason we want to maintain independence is not an arrogant reason. It's a speed reason. That I, d I don't think any of us can deny that government works thoroughly but slowly. And the advertising industry works very fast. And this is, this is my worry is always that I don't want to lose that speed of response. So for example, when COVID hit, we could immediately assess our code, look at our code, see, how, see do, we have, do we have aspects in our code that are going to be able to us um, are going to enable us to prevent advertising around misleading information around COVID and mask wearing, et cetera, et cetera. The code was good enough. We didn't have to step in, but we would have been able to step in. So that, when I, when I talk about maintaining our independence, it is for that reason that, uh, that I want us to maintain our ability to work fast. And also, I want industry to be regulating industry. It, industry understands it's itself. Um, the agencies understand the challenges <coughs> that they face. The marketers understand the challenges that they face. And I always think it's better for people with a with a day-to-day -day understanding of their challenges to be giving the input and, and forming the rules that regulate them. You, you're always going to get better buy-in like that. Right. And... Uh, the South African Human Rights Commission has got uh, wide powers and uh, given by the Constitution and uh, enabling legislation, the Human Rights Commission Act uh, 40 of 2013 and, and Pepuda. Now, but the Constitution gives the Human Rights Commission uh, the power, among others, to educate. I want to ask in connection with addressing the issue of uh, unconscious bias or an unconscious racism. I want to link that to the hair, the normal hair. There is this tendency recently uh, in, in South Africa and other uh, jurisdictions where you find people with black hair, they resort to extending their hairs to look like, pardon me, a white woman's hair. 
will uh, ARB be prepared to uh, stay to say, uh, keep your black hair. Black hair is beautiful. Well, <laughs> uh, I, I would love it. So the ARB's mandate is limited. We, our, our job is to make decisions on the code about the content of advertising. I, w I personally feel very strongly about this, this mission of black hair is wonderful, black is beautiful, and the need to communicate it. I think, I think that a lot of wrong has been done around that. I think uh, a lot of harm has been done, particularly to our girl children. Uh, I, th I really, it's something that personally I, I feel deeply about. Um, but is it, is it the role of the ARB to be putting out messages like that? No, it's beyond our mandate. Is it the role of the ARB to be supporting messages like that? Yes. If we get a complaint against an ad that says black is beautiful, and I'll give you an example. Black Lives Matter. We got complaints, lots of complaints, about ads that used Black Lives Matter in their payoff lines, you know, when, when, it, when it was, there, there was a, a surge where everybody was using Black Lives Matter in their, in their advertising. And we got a lot of complaints about it. And we got complaints from the type of people who say, but all lives matter. We did not entertain those complaints. We wrote them a letter explaining to them why saying all lives matter is tone deaf, to go back to my, my tone deafness um, use of language, um, we did not entertain them. If I got a complaint about any campaign that said black is beautiful or black hair is beautiful, I would not entertain a complaint against those ads. So that is how we can, that, that is how we can lend up our voice and our power to supportive movements like this. The other way we can, and this is, I'm now going to touch on a whole different area of our work. Um, we administer part of the Max Sector Charter, which is the BE Charter for the advertising and marketing industry. And we administer five points for the responsible social marketing aspect of that. We would always give those points to any agency that is backing a campaign like that, because that is a campaign that goes exactly to social responsible marketing. Um, and that is the sort of campaign that we want to see happening and that we want to encourage. I don't know if I've answered your question, other than getting emotional about her. Yes, you definitely answered <laughs> my question, but you have also uh, led me to my fourth and last question when you were talking about Black Lives Matter that arose out of the, the incident of uh, take off your knee, I can't breathe. And then uh, it happened in uh, uh, USA, in America. Mm. My, my last question was, you were saying racism is all over the world, but when you mentioned examples, you mentioned the UK, in uh, India. I, I'm just asking, why didn't you mention uh, USA? Uh, USA being uh, one of the first countries which came with uh, civil rights. Okay. But even currently, there are incidents of uh, uh, racism. Yeah, there certainly are. Um, because the examples I was talking about were examples where the self-regulatory organization has done specific research into racism in advertising. And that research has been done specifically in the UK and in India recently. Um, so, so I'm not talking about countries where racism is a problem. I'm not talking about countries where they should be doing more work on their racism. Um, I'm talking about countries that have done specific research into racism in advertising, where we can benchmark ourselves against their outcomes when we do our own research. I don't know if the US has plans to do that type of research. You know, we are a member of an international organization where we swap notes, so to speak, with, with people all over the country, all over the world. Um, the, the issue of racism in advertising is an issue everywhere. Um, it is an issue, it takes different faces in different places. So, so in Asian countries, there are 
issues that are very specific to the Asian population. Um, but it is, it is a challenge worldwide. It is, South Africa grapples with it with our history behind us. So we grapple with it in a different way to Sweden, who have a very different history, but we are all grappling with it. But it is the UK and India who have done research, specific research, and it is the UK and Holland who have tried to use the solution of unconscious bias training to, to fix the problem. I use the word fix very, as I said it, I didn't like it because I don't know that this is a problem that has an easy fix. There is no silver bullet. We have to attack this problem from so many different angles. And this is one of them. Thank you, Chairperson. No further questions. Thank you, <coughs> Commissioner Banyone. Perhaps uh, the one question from myself is uh, if you go to paragraph 11 of the terms of reference of this inquiry, you'll find it states the intended outcome of this inquiry is to establish a genuine culture of human rights and prevent discriminatory adverts which unfairly depicts discriminate and impair the dignity of the diverse people living in South Africa. Look, uh, to this extent, perhaps we as the Human Rights Commission, we have identified as one method of uh, trying to rectify and try to sort of diffuse the state of affairs as social cohesion. We have uh, organized a few workshops on social cohesion in trying exactly to address the question of uh, discrimination and racism in the country. Now my question is, how far and to what extent do you believe in social cohesion? The second one, have you ever organized workshop for your members workshops for social cohesion. And if you did, what issues were exactly addressed and what was the reaction of your members? And I think perhaps, uh, and I believe your members are both blacks and whites. What was their reaction? if ever that has been uh, organized. And if it has never been organized, why has it not been organized? Don't you think that perhaps it was one of the ways to try and diffuse the undesirable uh, situation that is there uh, regarding racism and discrimination in the country and in the organization? Thank you. Okay. Um, th there, there are many levels to that question, and I'm going to try and answer it on as many as I can. I think the first thing I have to go back to is the role of the ARB. And, and when I made my submission, I was very specific, and now I can't, and I don't have it in front of me, remember exactly which paragraph. I was very specific that, that I was addressing, I want to say paragraph 29 of the terms of reference. Because that is our area of expertise. We are a regulator of advertising in terms of the code of advertising practice. And our primary job is to deal with complaints in terms of that code of advertising practice and to make decisions around it. That is our primary job. As part of that job, we believe it is our responsibility 
to train our members in that code and to train our members in surrounding aspects of that code. And in, the, in light of that, we have historically offered a lot of training. So, so under the ASA, we offered a lot of training. Um, I had got it to a point that we were doing a monthly workshop about difficult topics. We had a workshop on racism, we had a workshop on gender, we had a workshop on um, social media um, and various aspects. With the demise of the ASA came a new challenge and I had to focus on our primary work, getting the money in to run a self-regulatory organization that makes decisions about the code. And training fell to the wayside to some extent because that is not our primary objective. I believe training is important. I believe we can be an important part of it. I believe we can do more than we are doing. However, I do not believe that is the job of the ARB primarily to be fixing this problem in the industry completely. I believe that there are other industry organizations that are better positioned than we are to be helping in this industry, to be helping with this problem, to be offering the training, to be reaching out. We have our core business of administering the code of advertising practice, and we have to focus on that core business first and foremost. There are other bodies that you will speak to in the course of this inquiry. And I, I feel a bit like I'm throwing my colleagues under the bus, um, but I would suggest that the ACA and MASA and these other industry bodies are better positioned than we are to be really engaging on a one-on-one, -on -one meaningful, um, proper training in these issues. But we want to offer to the Commission, to our, our sister industry bodies, to anybody who wants it, that we are happy to cooperate in any training, particularly training on the code of ethics, um, a code of advertising practice, sorry, um, and that we do believe, I do believe it is something we need to be working hard on. I believe, I believe that having conversations which happen in training can only ever help. Will it solve the problem? No, not alone. But it will always help. Having conversations is always the most helpful thing you can do. I hope I answered that. Okay, thank you. <coughs> Let me at this stage uh, ask the evidence leaders whether they have uh, any follow-up questions uh, to the witness. I don't, Chairperson. Okay, thank you. And uh, Harriet? Thank you, Chair. Um, Ms. Gale, um, I just want to go back to that uh, question that commissioners asked. Bearing in mind that you, you would like to offer training on unconscious biasness, bias, Social cohesion training could be an underlying um, part of that kind of training because it also deals with aspects of racism and it, to a large extent, collates quite a lot of uh, aspects because you've indicated that um, the terms that uh, Prof was, was alluding to about tone deafness and conscious biasness. Do you not think that that could also encompass social cohesion? Is it just going to be a separate thing altogether? Speaking as, as a person, not as the ARB, absolutely. But this is not our area of expertise, and that's why we would need to partner with other people. Even for unconscious bias training, we would need to partner with specialists in that type of training. Our specialization is our code. Our code has to be read together with these other issues, unconscious bias, social cohesion, all these other issues. We need to, we need to be working with other bodies, perhaps the commission, perhaps other bodies, um, 
to put together a holistic training that brings all these things together. But, you know, I, ca I, I have strong feelings about it as an individual. I have strong opinions about it as an individual. But the ARB's expertise is our code of advertising practice. And that's where we bring value to the room. We understand what the rules are. We understand what the rules are internationally. And we understand how people break them. That's our expertise. Finally. In your presentation, uh, you indicate that the research um, from India and the UK regarding unconscious biasness. And this regard, you're saying that they have gone ahead and done these trainings, but they're not as effective. There's still more to learn or more trainings to be done. So from the from the ARB uh, perspective, what have you done? Have you done any scoping regarding tailoring this kind of training to the South, South, the South African context? So in terms of training, yes, we've done, you know, we've done, we've offered the training that we, that we offer and we continue to offer around our code. Um, in t we have not done any research. We do, we do not have the resources, because to do proper research, you need to partner with a proper research partner. You need to do, pr you, you don't, you know, we, I don't want to do um, silly research. I want to do proper research. I want to partner with a proper research body and do in-depth research that, that we would be one organization that has an interest in the outcome, as has happened in the UK, as has happened in India. It's two different research projects that happened in those two countries, and they took different approaches. Um, but I, just, I also just want to point out that the research into the problem and the unconscious bias training are two different aspects. It's the unconscious bias training that our colleagues in other countries question how effective it is. So they've done a lot of that training, and then they, so they, they do an assessment of the advertising world. They assess wh what racism is appearing in ads, what subtle racism, what overt racism, et cetera. And then they do unconscious bias training. And then they see if there's a difference in the advertising. And they are finding that there is not. And that is a, a worrying thing. That is something that if we're going to do this type of training in South Africa, we need to very carefully look at what it is we're doing and are we actually going to bring about change? Because it's, it's all very well to talk. It's all very well to offer training. It's all very well to intellectualize about it. But if it doesn't bring about change, it hasn't done anything. Thank you, Gail. I'm done. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Harriet. Uh, <coughs> let me check. What time is it now? 11.49. Uh, I propose that uh, before we're going to call our next witness for the day, uh, we can have a, a break now, a body break, for 20 minutes. So if we could come here at about exactly 10 past 11. And uh, at? 10 past 12. 10 past? 12. 12. Okay, no, thank you very much. 10 past 12. So, Mrs. Gail Smile, you are now excused, and thank you very much for your contribution that you have made this morning to this inquiry. We really thank you, and uh, I think uh, you answered uh, the questions that we put to you. Uh, and thank you so much for giving me so much of your time this morning. I'm very appreciative. Thank you. Thank you. So we shall adjourn now.
Uh, we are going to proceed with the inquiry and uh, <clears throat> the witness is at the witness stand. Am I correct? Correct. Thank you. Uh, so for your benefit, I think uh, what I'll do, I'll introduce uh, the members of the panel. I'm the chairperson of uh, the inquiry. My name is Fukan Katla Malachi. And uh, next to me is uh, Commissioner Zbanyoni, who is also a panel member. And then we have uh, Professor, Professor Malungos who is also the third member of this panel. Greetings. So <coughs> what we'll do is uh, we'll uh, first, I will first ask uh, Commissioner Banyone to administer an oath to you. Commissioner Banyone. Thank you, Chairperson. We are now dealing with uh, the Institute for Race Relations uh, how should I address you, sir? Is it, I see here is written Mr. Gabriel Kraus. Kraus, ne? Krauser. Krauser. Thank you. Krauser. Should I address you as Mr.? That would be good. Thank you. Thank you. And my task is to administer the oath. And always, before we administer an oath, we establish whether uh, the person has got any objection towards taking the oath, because if that is the case, there is an option to uh, make an affirmation. So I have no objections. No objections. Having said that, then, uh, for record purposes, can you say your, your full names? I am Gabriel David Krauser. Thank you. Do you swear that the evidence that you will need shall be the truth, the whole Truth and nothing but the truth. If that is the case, please raise your right hand and say, So help me God. So help me God. Thank you, Chairperson. He's Julius Swan in. Thank you very much. Uh, before we can proceed, uh, let me make sure that you have the benefit of knowing the evidence leaders. We'll be leading evidence from you. Evidence leaders, please. And introduce yourself. Good afternoon, Chairperson. My name is Buwan Jones. Thank you. Are you the only leader, uh, evidence leader? No, Commissioner. Um, <coughs> my name is Zamantung Wampegi. Thank you, Zama. Thank you very much. So. <coughs> I'm going to ask uh, the evident leaders to proceed from from their side with the with the questions. However, before they do so, I've been requested uh, again to remind you that when you make your finding statement, please try and restrict it to 20 minutes. So over to you, evidence leaders. Uh, thank you, Chairperson. Uh, I think it is uh, uh, an opportune moment to ask the witness to take us through their statement uh, within the allocated time. Thank you. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much, and thank you to the Commission for this opportunity. One of the questions that we were posed in either the letter or the terms of reference, and I'm paraphrasing here, was what contributes to so much race in advertising? The question sounded to me a little bit like that question, why is it that the princess of South Africa has not come out to the party? Why have we not seen her in so long? 
question based on a false premise. There is a princess of South Africa. There's royalty in this country. There is no royalty over the domain of the So I'd like to take a investigate the assumptions behind the question. The first principles being what racism is, what the state of race relations in South Africa in general are, what it amounts to, racism in advertising, and what role we see the Commission as needing to serve to protect South Africa's republic in that regard. That's the slightly longer version. We find that race relations, and racism particularly in advertising, that race relations in general are good and that race, racism in advertising is, is not apparent. I said I want to get to first principles. And at first, well, I think connection between race and advertising. I subscribe to the social constructivist view of race. This that races are essentially social constructs. It is a view that races are biological. That biology, inheritance, uh, has a strong connection to phenotypes, to appearance. But at a deep level, we find that human beings are the same across races. That exists across races also exists within races. In short, races would not matter. And this is the same as a brand. In so far brand valuable. The, but the brand is only valuable as part of a social construct. In this sense, we can think of races like brands. And so we see this intimate connection between and advertising, which is the nexus on which the human that has to come and address. I want to go into the whole history of races as brands, uh, but I do think it's worth three remarks, particularly about what was going on in Berlin in the 1880s when social were very talking about races as brands. They were very explicitly cognizing races. They were very explicitly cognizing races as, uh, as social constructs that need to be boosted. In the same way that an, advertise, uh, an advertising agent will come to advertise a brand, they were saying, we need people to advertise the idea of the Aryan supremacist, of the supreme brand that is an Aryan race. While others were saying, no, we must advertise the Slav as a supreme race. Part of the reason I draw the Commission's attention to this period of history, and of course, uh, one of the foremost uh, thinkers to consult here is, uh, I believe I'm saying his name correctly, Heinrich von Treischke, who said effectively that every individual must submit himself to his or her race, because the race is the ultimate bearer of value. Part of the reason I draw attention to this point in history is because that idea of branding people by race was not duly challenged. And what followed was uh, two world wars 
instead of the end of slavery based on race resulting in liberal democracy spreading, it resulted through this brand management of races in another century of genocide and inhumanity. So we must be very wary of people who are trying to sell a race, trying to brand a race, whatever that race might be. And of course, in the 1880s, in the, 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 this Berlin uh, nexus, there was W.E.B. Du Bois, one of the first uh, proponents of blackness as a, as a brand to be sold, as a brand to be boosted. In his, uh, in his series of lectures called The Conservation of Races, he wanted to conserve races. He was very worried that races would melt away. They would lose their importance. The brands would be forgotten. He wanted to hold on to their importance. He said, the history of the world is the history not of individuals, but of groups, not of nations, but of races. And he who ignores or seeks to override the race idea in human history ignores and overrides the central thought of all history. It's a potent statement. To Dubois, blackness was supreme. But not just blackness. He thought other races must also stick together and their voices must come together. But not across race, only within race. At that time, the term apartheid had not yet been coined. But it is a moment in history that reflects to us that members of any race can advocate what was called the Volksgeist ideology. It is the ideology according to which there is a spirit of a race or a soul of a race and that each race has its own spirit and its own soul. In our opinion, when advertising or marketing or, pol or politicking gets involved in trying to promote this idea that souls have colors, that at our innermost we are separate or separated by our race, we find ourselves winding the clock back on history and going towards that which we should turn away from. So we are very sensitive to the concerns that the commission must have about people trying to brand races, trying to say this race has these uh, special qualities, and that race has those special qualities, and so you should buy this product or that product based on something deep inside rather than something superficial that is, that is differentiated by race. And while that concern is very serious and very important, the evidence is very encouraging. If we look at race relations in South Africa, there is immediately a methodological question. How do we understand the means, the, the ways in which South Africans relate to one another? One idea is that if you ask a single person, that person can speak for everybody in his or her race. That is the Volksgeist idea because on the Volksgeist idea, every race has its own spirit. So every member of that race is tapped into the same spirit. They can all speak for each other. If you ask me what is my race, and then you ask me what I think, that idea will stand for what everybody else in my race thinks. And the same is true for the next person of the next race. We reject that methodology because, again, we reject the assumption that lies behind the question. We do not think that any person can speak for an entire race. And so when we try to understand how are people relating to one another, we do not ask one individual on Twitter, we do not wait for one politician or one famous person to opine on behalf of everybody who looks the same. Instead, 
we try to do the best that we can to hire independent companies to do surveys of large and randomly sampled groups of individuals. In this way, we think we can strike a balance between the necessary epistemic humility that we must exercise, which is to say, we mustn't pretend we know more than we really know, which is what happens when you ask one person and attribute the answer to a whole group. We balance that with the need to give some answers. This year we are having a census where every South African will be asked questions, but it is extremely arduous and difficult. We cannot do that all of the time. And so in between censuses, we must ask samples of South Africans and use the powerful tool of statistics to extrapolate from that. Now the results I would like to go through in the evidence more, in more detail. But for now, let me simply say that the results are overwhelmingly positive, especially if you compare the results of surveys and not just those that have been commissioned by us with the impression that is created on the grand stages of South Africa. And perhaps I should say this is a pretty grand stage. So I'm very grateful for the opportunity to say that there is good news in this country, that most ordinary South Africans, at least when it comes to race, are in a much better place than we have ever been in before. Does that mean South Africa is doing well? No. There are many other problems that are much greater and in fact that are getting worse. And of course, we all know what is the biggest problem in South Africa. No one really needs the survey to tell you. But we do the surveys, and we find every time that unemployment is the greatest problem in this country. Race relations, meanwhile, as I said, have never been better. Now, if we look at advertising in particular, I find it very, very encouraging what I see in the terms of reference of the Commission's inquiry. Their reference is made to four or five adverts, I stand under correction, a very small number of adverts that have been accused of, of being racist. Only four or five. And of those, the one that raised the most eyebrows, the Tresemme hair ad, that ad specifically has just been exonerated by a court, by an equality court in South Africa. So the one that seemed maybe the most likely to be racist has been found by a court not to be racist. This is very good news. Consider the following. In the year 2021, uh, a brand manager tracked 7,562,515 adverts flighted in South Africa. Radio ads, 1,851,101 ads flighted in South Africa in that year. Print, 58,153 adverts. Now, I would not like to mislead the commission into believing that this is all of the ads that were created. It certainly must be the case that more were created than that. But these are the ads that have been verified as having been flighted distinctly in the year 2021 by a market research analyst. And those details, of course, will be provided in our written submissions. So that is almost, almost 10 million ads in one year. Then if you date back to 2013, which is when I think the first alleged uh, racist ad appears in the terms of re reference, we go from almost 10 million to maybe 80, maybe 90 million adverts. If the average of 2021 was similar to the average of those earlier years. Now we are not sure about that. It is a speculation. But of course, we all know that in 2021, South Africa had terrible economic conditions. So it would be surprising if there were 
more ads in the, in the winter of our discontent than there had been in earlier years. But give or take, let's say in the last, uh, in the last eight years, the last nine years, let's say conservatively there have been 60 million ads or 50 million ads. Maybe let's say one ad for every South African somewhere around 58 million ads. It seems that the commission has only been presented with four or five that are accused of racism. That is a success rate that I think all South Africans can be proud of, especially when you consider of those four or five, maybe none of them were actually racist. If we are to follow the deference to the Equality Court. If it is the case that zero ads have been produced in the last seven or eight years that were racist, I think the Commission is in an excellent place to say, well done, South Africa. Well done, South Africa's advertising industry. You get a gold star for non-racialism. You have gone forward. A great thing has been done. And I would encourage the Commission not to think that congratulations lead to complacency. Every behavioral psychologist knows the same thing that every parent knows, the same thing that every decent South African knows. When we do well, we must congratulate each other. And it seems to me that we have done very well. So I'm very happy to be here on such a proud day where we can say, well done, South Africa. We have beaten racism in the advertising industry. Now, unfortunately, that does not mean the advertising industry is without its problems. There are great challenges. With two million extra unemployed people through the force of uh, the, the era of the command council, with uh, no, effectively no new jobs having been added since 2008, with most people my age and younger out of work, I was out of work for some time. As a young man, I know that it makes, it's a very difficult thing and it can make people very angry and it can make them prone to, to outrageous behavior. I think South Africa is sitting in a very dangerous position. If we do not right the ship in terms of the hard and real problems, those problems that are identified in our polls by most South Africans, by most South Africans, Unemployment, crime, corruption, housing, service delivery, water, and so on down the line. If we do not solve those problems, first and foremost, and most obviously, we are, we are letting human value be squandered. But secondly, and this is germane to the Commission's Roll right here. We know from history, including the history of South Africa, but also the history of the world, that when economic conditions get worse and advertisers end up selling dreams that nobody can purchase and jealousy or zonda rule the day, then it is possible for demagogues to come along and sell a false solution. And the greatest danger in South Africa is to sell the false solution that racism or a racial brand or a Volksgeist of some race or another will dig us out of the hole. As we are sworn to in our constitution, and as we know, only through non-racialism can South Africa go forward. Only through non-racialism can we improve the lives, both in terms of dignity and in terms of justice, and in terms of material circumstance of the majority of South Africans. I think the most encouraging thing maybe that I can say is that behavioral science has revealed, and we will refer to this in our written submissions, that people who were once loyal to a race can easily become loyal to a much more profound group for example, like a country, if only there is a project to work on together. 
And I see us as working on that project. And I say quite seriously, brand South Africa is the most proud brand in all advertising we could consider here. It is very sad that especially some politicians corrupt that brand. But ordinary South Africans are committed to lifting it out of the mud and putting it at the apex of the rainbow, just where it belongs. Thank you. That concludes my opening remarks. Uh, th thank you for your contribution and for that brief opening statement, which will assist in this quest by the Commission to make a determination on issues that are uh, uh, plaguing society. Chair, I would like to suggest that um, uh, with more energy to ask questions. <laughs> if it's possible, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, but I just want to find out one thing. Uh, how many witnesses do we still have for the day? Uh, we have one more, uh, a representative uh, of, uh, from a, a foundation. Be, be true to me. Uh, be true to me. Yes. Okay. No, thank you. Then uh, that's fine. What time is it now? Quarter to one. Okay, so shall we all adjourn now? We're going to adjourn uh, the session up to quarter to two. That is 1.45. We have an hour. Let's come again uh, at uh, 1.45. And uh, Mr. Cruiser, uh, again at... Uh, Quarter to two, you'll be required to hear, to be here to take the stand. Is that all in order? I'm very happy with that. Thank you. Okay. Then, uh, okay, the inquiry agents until quarter to two.
Proceedings resume, and uh, the witness, Mr. Kuza, you remain shown in, and then I'm giving this opportunity to the evidence leader to proceed with the proceedings, to proceed with the questioning. Thank you. Thank you, Chairperson. Before I delve into uh, issues uh, that are pertinent to this investigation, um, could you kindly tell us what is your role at the Institute for Risk Relations? Thank you very much. Happy to do so. I am an analyst and researcher at the IRR. I have worked in that capacity um, since I first joined, and that is in 2018, in the winter thereabouts of 2018. Uh, originally, I joined the IRR as an investigative journalist, essentially. I was sent, or I pitched, and they agreed to send me to rural KZN uh, to speak to victims of dispossession of land. Um, and I remained on the land question for some years. As of about this time last year, let's say March or April 2021, I got a new role, which is the head of campaigns. In that capacity, I have led various campaigns, uh, in, that, in the course of which we have gathered well over 100,000 signatures from South African citizens to petition members of the executive or members of parliament uh, to alter the course of this country. Uh, those have included campaigns against the attempt to amend the constitution. Uh, in that regard, we gathered hundreds of thousands of signatures. And we succeeded in blocking the amendment to the constitution. We succeeded in protecting section 25. Unfortunately, we have not yet succeeded in rolling out title deeds to over 12 million South Africans that are living on government land. But we continue that mission. We also succeeded in delaying the uh, Firearm Control Amendment Act, which would have banned people from owning a gun for the purpose of self-defense. Uh, we have campaigned against the Command Council, uh, and I thought we had succeeded with the comments we heard last week. But I've just seen in Kosozana Gamini Zuma. The Honourable Minister has extended it once again. So we will continue that fight. Um, that should give a small <coughs> idea of the kind of work I do. Yeah. And you are here to represent the Institute, correct? I'm here to represent the Institute, that's correct. Uh, what is the ideological location of the Institute, particularly in articulating um, its notions of race? Thank you. The Institute was is a... Uh, 
is a non-racial institute, first and foremost. It is a classical liberal institute. That means we find the kernels of value in the universe, in our society, to be individuals. Individual choice is sacrosanct. We believe that the best route out of poverty is a limited government that is accountable to the people. We believe that free markets work. We believe that individual choice is, is potent and should come foremost, and we believe in non-racialism. If I can add one small thing, it is that I have tried in my opening remarks, although they were truncated, to explain some sense of a definition of race and of racism. I would be happy to elaborate on that briefly. And I'm also happy to say that different people will have different definitions of what is a race and what is racism. And we implore the commission to make clear what its definition of race is and what its definition of racism is. We believe that this could offer clarity um, and a clarity of purpose, both to the Commission and to South Africans who wish to support it uh, in its endeavor to protect human rights uh, as we wish to support it. Thank you. Um, for much of our history, um, racism, would you agree that racism has been a defining feature of South Africa? Simply, I would say, since its inception, for the most part, racism has been the problem in South Africa. The major problem, number one. And as a step to deal with Racism, we adopted the Constitution in 1996 as a step towards a comprehensive strategy to address the historical legacies of racial and gender discrimination. What would be those historical legacies of racial and gender discrimination in South Africa, in your view? I think it is good for a Chapter 9 Institute to look to the Constitution of 1996 as a watershed. In fact, it was a watershed. But we would be doing a terrible disservice to ordinary South Africans if we thought all of the change comes from the top. In fact, by that point, most South Africans of all races had embraced a new idea. The idea of judging one another by the content of our character and not by the color of our skin. We saw that with the 1992 referendum within the white population. Now it is of course a travesty that there were ever elections in this country in which only one race could participate. And we know very well that that travesty lasted for much too long. But it is also a fact that that referendum indicated something about the part that that particular, the majority of people in that race group were willing to take. When it comes to South Africans of all races, we can see in the results of the 1994 election, in combination with the promises made by the first elected president of all race democratic South Africa, Nelson Mandela, you can see by the connection between those promises and the popularity that most people had already embraced a new vision. In some sense, the Constitution is not the beginning. It is the entrenchment of the values that most South Africans already embraced by the birth of the new South Africa. I say that because when asking questions about legacy, we need to distinguish, I think, between three things. The law, property relations, and human relations. 
1994, the law was not yet there. It only got there properly with the Constitution of 1996. The property relations were also not yet there. But the human relations, to a major extent, to an irresistible extent, were already there. And by there I mean the majority of South Africans were committed to the idea that we will go forward together. No, I hear you, but you haven't answered. What are those historical legacies? So, I will, I will say again, the legacy gets traced, in my mind, in three parts. The first is the law, the second is property rights, and the third is how humans relate one to another. Let me talk about property rights and property relations in terms of legacy of apartheid. What, what is the question from uh, the evidence leader? I believe he what just said very clearly that his question is what is the legacy of racism in South Africa? His question was what do you understand by racial and gender discrimination? I had answered that question then he went on to ask the legacy. But if, you, if I'm misunderstanding, I might very well be misunderstanding, then I, I defer to you or to the evidence leader in terms of what I should address. <coughs> the legacy or the definition? Yeah, no, I, I, I had moved on, uh, Commissioner, even though uh, I don't think the, the, the answer was uh, sufficient, um, but this is for the panel to make a, a, a determination. But I'd, I want him to um, answer my question on the historical legacies which continue to, to, uh, we continue to grapple with as a society that were occasioned by a system called apartheid. Uh, commissioners, with your leave, I think maybe I understand the misunderstanding. Um, I didn't hear a question directly about the definition. So, and the evidence leader is saying that I have not answered adequately. So maybe I can just offer the definition, yeah. and then we can move really. to the legacy. Yeah, I'm mindful of time, just briefly, and then you get to the legacies briefly, so that we can move to other questions, yeah. Great. So I take, uh, I take it to be the case that racism occurs when a person or group of persons or a legal person uh, acts towards another person or group of persons in such a fashion as to cause harm and where the reason for that harm being caused is that the first party, the one doing the harm, has a negative attitude towards the second party because of their race. In other words, it's when we judge each other by the content of our character and that causes harm. I mean, it's when we judge each other by the color of our skin and it causes harm. That is, the, that is the working hypothesis under which I operate insofar as the definition of racism. And again, I implore the Commission to provide its definition at some point. And now on to the legacy. Yeah. That was brief. So, as I was saying, uh, property relations are very important to look at in terms of this legacy. We have found that uh, Stats SA did an inequality report, I think published in 2020, maybe 2019, just before the pandemic. Uh, we will refer to it precisely in our notes. And what that inequality report showed was a major change in the, in the nature of property relations among the races. It found that in 2006, the split between income, black and white, was more or less 50-50. And of course, with white people numbers-wise being far fewer than black people in South Africa, that meant per capita there was a a huge asymmetry. 
By 2015, and this is the latest date for which such data is available, it found that things had changed very much. And even more so if you consider where things had come from in the 90s. So if I can go through the numbers briefly. In 2015, the StatsSA data indicate that the black top 10%, and I'm using black to mean African, the black top 10% earned 25.9% of national income, the largest share of any particular group. The black middle 50% earned 21.6% of income. The black bottom 40% earned 3.7% of income, much too low, and hardly changing since 2006. The white top 10% had come down to earning 10.8% of income. The white middle 50% earned 18.8% of income. The white bottom 40% earned 4.4% of income. The colored top 10% earned 4.2% of income. The colored middle 50% earned 4.8% and the bottom 40% earned less than 1% of national income. And then the final category, the Indian top 10% earned 1.9% of national income. The middle 50% earned 2.6% of income. And the bottom 40% earned 0.5% of income. Now, if I can just summarize that, it's a lot of numbers. The point is, if you look at the black top 10% in terms of Africans, as it is categorized by the government. Uh, the earning was 2.5 times higher than the white top 10%. And if you look at the black 10% in terms of BEE, including coloreds and Indians, it was more or less three times higher than the white top 10%. So in per capita terms, uh, it remains the case that the average white person earns more than the average black person. And the easy way to understand this is unfortunately in the unemployment numbers. But if you are looking at the elite, here we are in Rosebank, in a, one of the most expensive parts of South Africa. It is no surprise to see a wealthy black person buying a very expensive single malt glass of whiskey at the rooftop bar. Because things have changed. 30 years ago, it would have been a big surprise. Today, it is not even a surprise in Rosebank or Santon to go to a very expensive place and see that uh, black people are the vast majority and white people are a minority. And of course, we can see in terms of uh, representation problems, for example, at the Cape Bar, that because of the quota system, black women were denied promotion by quotas because the majority of candidates that would have gone through on a merit-based system would have been black women because of the copious amount of talent and skill and excellence. This is truly uh, a very different state of affairs to the state of affairs that we found ourselves in in 1980 or 1990. And of course, with some reference to what I've already seen by way of representations to the commission yesterday, I know that many people say nothing has changed especially very wealthy people and it, very powerful people. And it is unfortunate for them to say that because for, for many it has changed. But for too many South Africans, things have not changed materially. The legacy of poverty lives on and something must be done about that for sure. And we have very strong views about what can be done. In our opinion, First and foremost, besides you know, rolling our title deeds, we have to get to a place where our laws respect merit and do not incentivize rent seeking and do not incentivize uh, scapegoating failures to serve poor people by pretending that whenever you help black people, you are helping poor people. Those two things cannot be equated. Those categories cannot be said to overlap 100%. Of course, in the height of apartheid, there was a terrible such overlap. But things have changed profoundly. 
as I have laid out using StatsSA's data. Uh, if I understand your positionality, you are effectively denying that there is racism. Or racism is a problem in South Africa. That is incorrect. You agree that racism is a problem. Racism is definitely a problem wherever it takes place. And it is certainly the case that racism uh, does occur from time to time, from place to place, within the borders of South Africa. And we have had a testimony from the institute, uh, no, not the institute, the ARB, which represents the advertising sector that bought corroborate this claim that racism is a challenge in the sector. And yet, Elia, you boldly asserted in very strong terms that racism is not a problem in advertising. I, I will stand under correction. But I believe what I said is racism is not a problem in South, Adver in South African advertising products. So it might be the case that if you go into the, the bowels of the industry, and I know some people in advertising, uh, I don't think it's unfair to say, many would agree with the characterization that it is an industry that lives very hard, uh, that uh, does not sleep very much, is always trying to be on trend. If you go into the bowels, I do not know what you will find. Maybe some instance will be found of racism. But if you look at the products that come out, what I said is there seems to be no evidence of racism. And I say that because the terms of reference of the Commission's inquiry only includes five impugned adverts out of potentially 80 million flighted ads in that period. And as far as I can tell, even if all five of them were racist, this would, this would be to say it's a very small problem compared, comparing five to 80 million. But since the Equality Court found that the Tresemme Clicks Hair ad, which was the most eyebrow raising, which caused the most outrage, since the Equality exculpated that advert, it seems all of the other ads should have a similar uh, uh, finding, which is that they are not racist. And if there is not one single ad that can be held up to South Africans as an example of a racist ad, then I think the Commission can only conclude a bit of good news, which is that racism has been beaten out of advertising products in this country. And I say once again, no one should hesitate to say good news in this country. Yeah, my, my colleague will address uh, you on some of the adverts, uh, but I was hasting to add that there is a reason why we just highlighted notable adverts which elicited widespread public discourse and condemnation. And that is not to say that there are other adverts, um, you know, that we did not consider, but there are many adverts, but we just chose um, for purposes of this inquiry to highlight those because they received widespread um, media coverage and elicited widespread response from political parties and society. I hear you, and I, I think that if some other ad is found somewhere and it can be shown, uh, then I will retract the statement that it has been, racism has been completely beaten out. And I will say it has almost been completely beaten out, and it's very close, and, and uh, nevertheless, we should be happy even if we are not perfect, that we are so good compared to where we used to be. But at this stage, I can only assume that the Commission has highlighted the most egregious examples. And uh, as I've said, it, it, I'm not convinced that any of them are racist, especially after this finding. But we can get into those details at a later stage, as you say. I, I want to probe further on your understanding um, of, of, of racism. In your view, 
is is racism in fact what, what do you understand by institutionalized structural and systemic racism i think that's a good question for all south africans to think about in economic academic literature a distinction is made between taste-based racism and statistical discrimination. Taste-based racism means one person just prefers people of a certain race and has an to people of a That is the straightforward kind of racism I was talking about. When you ask me what is my definition of racism, it is when you have a taste-based racial discrimination and then you manifest it. This is different to statistical discrimination. Statistical discrimination is the kind of thing that underlies a policy like BEE. BEE does not say that every black person is poor. BEE does not have to deny that our president is a billionaire and that his children grew up proverbially with a silver spoon in their mouth. It does not have to deny that there is diversity within a race. But it says, as a matter of statistics, more members of this race belong to the unemployed group and fewer members of that race belong to the unemployed group. So rather than looking for poor people to help, we will just look for black people to help. Because statistically, there is a greater overlap of poverty in the black group than of poverty in the white group. That is called statistical discrimination. And why does that matter for an yeah, analysis no, of systemic uh, please, racism? No, yeah, can you address me on, uh, you've provided your own definitions. Of, uh, I'm, using, uh, I'm using not my own definitions, I'm using standard uh, economic textbook definitions of taste-based racism. I, I've asked you ab about your understanding of institutionalized racism. In order to understand it, you have to understand statistical discrimination. Here's no, why. No, Barack no, no, Obama no. gives a very good example. He says the problem with many, um, for many black people to accumulate wealth in America in the, in the 70s, he wrote about this in his book, Dreams of My Father, he said the problem was statistical discrimination. If a black person moved into a neighborhood in Chicago, one or two members of that neighborhood would have taste-based racism. They would not want to live with a black person. Theoretically, this no should not cause too much of a problem because they can move out, others can move in, things will be fine. But there was statistical discrimination. Other members of the white group would move out, not because they had a taste against black people, but because they made a statistical calculation, which was a sad one, but an accurate one, that if there are more black people in the neighborhood, the value will go down. So they move out to protect the value of their house on a statistical judgment. They are not personally hateful, but they see how the statistical game is played, so they move out. The effect of that is the housing price goes down. And the effect of that is that those black people who have worked very hard and have bought a house for 10, the value of that house comes down to 8. And then it comes down to 5. And then it becomes a ghetto. And then they cannot pass on that wealth. My understanding of institutionalized racism is when you have a combination of taste-based discrimination and statistical-based discrimination whose effect is to make it impossible or very difficult or more difficult than it would otherwise be for members of one racial group to uh, enjoy equal opportunities to members of other racial groups. Thank you. Uh, the, the Department of Justice and Constitutional Development launched a national action plan to combat racism, racial discrimination, xenophobia, and related intolerance. And this is how they define institutionalized racism. 
It refers to rules, norms, routines, patterns of attitudes and behavior in institutions and other societal structures that represent obstacles to groups or individuals in achieving the same rights and opportunities that are available to the dominant group. Do you agree with this definition? I think that in substance that is a workable definition and a very good definition for institutionalized racism. I was trying to add something which is uh, the extra step you need to understand systemic racism. Because of course the systemic racism can exceed merely what institutional rules there are that are, that are causing harm. To what extent has the Institute of um, Race Relations considered issues of discrimination alongside more systemic challenges in society? I would say that is what we spend almost all of our time considering. Um, it is the case that our analysis is very similar to the analysis we find in ordinary South Africans through our polling, but is very different to expert analysis. So in our analysis, it is certainly the case that South Africa's government in the last um, 10 or 15 years has badly hampered the prospects of poor South Africans, most of whom are black. And uh, we we read those people who say that the ANC should be accused of systemic racism. Helen Ziller, uh, the ch chairperson of the Democratic Alliance, FedEx, wrote in her book, uh, Go Woke, Go Broke, uh, something to the effect that the ANC is systemically racist because it is harming black people disproportionately. I can see the argument but I think that uh, I must disagree in some regard because uh, of two things. Uh, I think there are two reasons that the ANC should not be accused of being systemically racist against black people. The first reason is that I don't believe, even amongst the most corrupt politicians in this country, that the intention is to make the poor poorer. Uh, it might be the effect, but I don't believe it's the intention. And I do think intention must figure into one's analysis at some point. And secondly, uh, so that is on the institutional racist side. On the systemic racist side, I don't think that statistical racism or statistical forms of discrimination um, are causing, uh, I don't find evidence for the claim that that is causing a diff dispreference for black people and a preference for white people. And that is to use the Obama example because in wealthy areas like Rosebank, like Santon, that situation he was describing of one black person moving in and then that changing the whole scenario, that is long in the past. Now we are in a situation, uh, and in fact we have strong evidence to suggest that we have long been in a situation where uh, rich people of all races are very enthusiastic to live with and play with uh, rich people of all races. Uh, you ha have done a lot of work on uh, race relations in the country. In your view, what is the reality of black people in South Africa? What is the reality of white people in South Africa? So in my view, there is more of a difference within the black group and within the white group than across those groups. What does that mean? Within the black group, as I was saying, the black top 10% is earning one quarter of all South African wealth, whereas the black foot bottom 40% is earning less than 4% of all wealth. We move uh, 
where I did my first project in rural KZN, through to <laughs> Santon, we can see a huge contrast in lifestyle and prospects. Likewise with the white group, of course, the proportion of white people that are living in squatter camps or begging on the side of the road is much smaller. But no South African who has traveled around can be surprised to see a white homeless person. And the difference in that person's lifestyle and prospects to someone who has a job uh, and has maybe even a very, very nice lifestyle it is, of course, Heterogeneity is one thing, but there are points to be made about, um, about group attitudes. And if you would give me the opportunity, I can go through a few key findings in terms of, of people's attitudes broken down in our surveys by race. Uh, because of time, uh, you, you can uh, make a written submission. Do you have a supplement uh, by making a written submission? Um, yesterday, we had the oral testimony of the head of political education at the Economic Freedom Fighters. His submission in a nutshell is to the effect that a life of blackness in South Africa is that of a racialized reality. What is your reaction to that? My response is that when we asked people have you personally any form of racism race in the last five years? Yes. Eighty percent of black respondents said no. And again, on that one, my colleague will, will uh, um, ask you questions on your sampling and how you went about. Yeah. Uh, if uh, I can just before getting to the sampling, just to. Yeah. Just to my opening remarks for the Commission's benefit Just to what I'm saying now. In the opening, I was saying there's this idea from the 1880s where people like Trashka, people like W.E.B. Du Bois, if you ask one black person, they can tell you what all other black people think. If you ask one Slav, they can tell you what all other Slavs think. If you ask one Aryan, they can tell you what all Aryans think. Why? Mystical connection. Now, I've suggested to you this was an exercise in brand building. They were trying to build a brand of a race. They were trying to build a loyalty to that race. I reject that methodology of trying to understand what people think. I prefer the methodology of asking many people and noticing that there are differences. Some black people say this, some black people say that. Some white people say this, some white people say that. Then we can find averages. And then we can find something interesting. This is a much more democratic approach. The alternative approach is neither scientific nor democratic. democratic. It is, in it fact is in a false geist approach. Which leads, which leads to fascism. Yeah. And just on uh, Dubois, um, so that we don't take his views out of context, um, Would you agree that to a large extent the ideology of blackness was in response to European racism? To a very large extent, almost entirely. And that white racism is a false science, a false science that was developed in order to justify the exploitation and oppression of black people. Correct. So in order for South Africa and the advertising industry to achieve the ultimate objective of a non-racist order, even a single episode of a racist advert should be taken seriously by the South African Human Rights Commission. Any instance of a, of a racist advert should be taken seriously. Uh, I would say it should be taken seriously by all South Africans. So, what in your view, um, although you have said uh, the sector does not have racism, 
and the sector would disagree as per the submissions we received earlier today. In terms of practical changes, patterns of behavior, um, what is that that, that can be done? I mean, if you, if you look at other sectors, for black entrants, it is always difficult. The barriers of entry for entry are used to exclude um, black people from accessing the mainstream economy. So as the Institute for Race Relations, um, which is also aligned to the Free Market Foundation, if I'm, if I'm well, no, I said we're aligned to free market principles. Or, or, or free market principles, yes. Um, wh what is it that you recommend should be done um, in order to have a genuine culture of human rights, in order to bring about the d desired tr transformation? If you look at the entire value chain of the industry, you will see that the composition uh, of the companies that they get the fair share of um, um, income from advertising is still predominantly white people. So what is it that can be done to redress this imbalance? I take it that you are stipulating that in the advertising industry, there is some proportion of wealth that is going to black people and some proportion that is going to white people without uh, putting any numbers to it. That puts me in an awkward position. I'll tell you why. My view is that in order to understand what to do, you have to understand where you are. If it's the case that 95% of the advertising industry is owned and operated by white people, and 5% is owned and operated by black people, then you are in a different world to the one in which 70% is owned and operated by black people and 30% is owned and operated by white people. The reason for the difference is that comes from the definition of systemic racism that I gave. If you split apart taste-based and statistical discrimination, you'll find in the world where it's 95 to 5, where a tiny minority has 95% of the wealth, then I believe there will be an argument for government intervention to try and balance the scales, to try and off-put that statistical discrimination that will come from people whose values are fine, but their self-interest is leading them in a wrong way because of how imbalanced the thing is in the first place. But if you are in a situation, even where it's 50-50, uh, or uh, in terms of uh, operation, something like that. No such moves will be necessary. Also, no such moves will be necessary. Not in play, because there'll be no reason for the statistical discriminators to then follow the taste-based discriminators in the wrong direction. So without knowing the numbers, I can't give you a proposition of how to The black top 10% is earning three times more than the white top 10% in absolute terms. The buying power that is associated with that is so great that, that it would be mind-boggling if white racists were nevertheless able to outcompete non-racial South Africans of all colors uh, for business in that market. I think the, the upper crust is just too diverse for racists to hold a monopolistic advantage. So that is why I claim <coughs> that uh, unless there is something I don't understand, People's voluntary exchanges uh, should 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 be sufficient to do the job. Thank you. Um, for the sake of time, I'll limit myself to.
three questions. <coughs> uh, the first question, am I audible? It's fine, okay. Um, my first question was addressed by Buwang. The second one is then, um, according to the IRR, who bears the brunt of apartheid policies? Uh, could you give me a time index? So, do you mean who bears the brunt today, or who bears the brunt during the period in which those policies were in force? Today. I would say... some level to evaluate the connection between a policy that is taken out of force 30 years at one point and then 30 years later to, to disaggregate who is benefiting and who is being harmed by such a policy. As a general proposition, there are technical problems with uh, trying to do that uh, very simply. But, notwithstanding the qualifications that I would offer, if time allowed, um, I would say, overwhelmingly, poor South Africans bear the brunt of apartheid policies. And if I can just give a small sense of the qualification, the qualification is this. In the intervening 30 years, something must have happened people that are, are bearing the brunt, it might very well be that what has happened is other policies that make things worse or that fail to make things better. So I would never want to solely blame contemporary poverty on something that is unchangeable and that is stuck 30 years ago. Okay, and <clears throat> um, according to the IRR, who or what is the composition of the poor in South Africa? How does the poor look like based on, ra on, on a race analysis? Who are the poor in South Africa according to the IRR? Uh, members of all races are included in the group, uh, the poor. Um, sorry, just one second. <laughs> Members of all races are included in that group. Uh, the, the, the black group is disproportionately represented in that group. So the majority are the black? Well, so the well, majority, so the majority, majority of most, most um, ways, of ways of breaking down South African society is going to be black, because black, 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 black people are the majority. I'm saying, I'm saying it's, even it's even more than, more than what you would, what you would expect, expect if you were just, just going, going by, by the demographic the breakdown of South Africa. As the IRR, have you ever identified adverts that you would that you would consider racist or discriminatory in nature? We have certainly discussed uh, uh, both amongst uh, ourselves and in public, public. Uh, uh, adverts that have been accused of being racist. racist. Um, um, I, have I have discussed one of, one of the allegedly, allegedly racist ads, ads which was the chicken, chicken, chicken ad, ad called Big John. Big John. Mm -hmm. Black, black man, man sails, sails up, up to the Netherlands, Netherlands and invents, invents the word, word Europe, Europe in a comical, a comical fashion. fashion. Um, uh, my, my conclusion, conclusion that it's not a racist, racist ad. ad. Um, I think, I in, think fact, in fact, uh, I, have I have discussed with, with, with some, some colleagues, colleagues all of the all ads, ads that are that in are terms of terms reference. reference. Um, um, so we've so certainly, certainly considered, considered the issue. issue. Right. So, has the IRR ever identified and said that as an institution we would consider Advert X um, racist or discriminatory in nature? Based on any ground, maybe. But let's deal with racism for, this, for the purpose of this question. As far as I'm aware, the answer is no. Okay. We have condemned as racist various remarks that are made by public figures. As it has in my first radio interview with the IRR was... Uh, 
I was on, on comment on that. On that. And with and argumentation, argumentation, I condemn them as racist, racist in speech. Uh, as, uh, a, as, as a representative of the IRR. And there are various instances, instances where I've been called, called upon, upon to do that. Do that. And as a and upon identifying that a particular uh, conduct is racist, i.e., uh, the one that um, you have identified, what mechanisms are available within the IRR to address, or uh, what have you done? Um, in instances that you, as the Institute for Race Relations, uh, have identified that there are, there is a racist statement that is being made. What have you done? Is, it, and is there something that you can do as the IRR? And what have you done as the IRR? So where the facts are already in, and we understand the situation in, in its totality, uh, uh, a simple thing that we can do is, as I said, said offer a public condemnation. As I was elucidating in the beginning, there are these there three categories, categories power, power property, property, and then and the third one, branding, branding prestige, prestige, this universe of human, human relations. relations. Um, we, think we think it's very important, very important that South Africans South Africa engage in voluntary exchange of congratulating, congratulating one, another. one another. We do good we things. things. For example, it seems good. good. We can find our racist ads. Good for the industry. If someone does a racist thing, you must say that's bad. We do so on the basis, as I've argued from the beginning, that most South Africans are already in a pretty good headspace in terms of race relations. Uh, 80% say that jobs should be appointed on merit in our polls. 80% say that they've personally not experienced any form of racism in the last five years. 80% say they benefit more from uh, vouchers than the EE. A majority say that politicians exaggerate race divides in order to excuse their own failures. In this sense, our outlook is shared by the majority of South Africans. And so we don't think that force needs to come in. We certainly don't call the police to interfere with speech because we don't think that the state, police, fines, anything like that is necessary in the ordinary course of affairs because in the ordinary course of affairs, for South Africans to criticize one another stings and that is a good control for bad behavior if that bad behavior is confined to words. Now, sometimes it goes beyond words, and that is a, another issue. Sometimes we do not know the facts, and then the IRR will send in investigators. It is in this regard that I have done a lot of work for the IRR. For example, at Schweizer Reinecke, a primary school in Northwest, there was an allegation of racism. There was a photograph that went around uh, showing white children sitting at one table and black children sitting at another table. And the conclusion drawn on social media was that this is a racist teacher who is segregating her students in a fashion of apartheid. And various people condemned this as racist. I wanted to know, if this teacher is splitting the children by race because she wants to enforce an apartheid mentality, I want to know that so I can join that condemnation. But maybe there is another explanation. I can't know that without investigating. So I went to investigate. It took me uh, some days, maybe a week. Eventually I found parents, black parents, whose children had been with that teacher the previous year, who had a long experience, therefore, with this teacher. I found the black parents whose in whose children's name the original complaint was made. And I found amongst all of those black parents a unanimous judgment that there was a misunderstanding, that racism was never involved in that incident, and that, in fact, that teacher was a very caring, non-racial person who loved all her students. So what I was able to do for, for all South Africans in that case was present the evidence that here's an allegation of racism. Here are people condemning the racism. But, in fact, the evidence shows there was no racism. This is a little bit like what the Equality Court, what Judge uh, Dolamo did, where he said... Everybody got excited about this Clix ad. Even uh, pharmacies were, were looted and broken. That is how angry people got. And if you just look at the social media pictures, maybe it looks like that ad was racist. But if you look at the bigger picture, if you see all of the evidence, if you see what was cropped out, then you find it's not racist after all. 
So sometimes I think the Human Rights Commission must agree. Unfortunately, because of our history, sometimes people invent racism. They fake allegations of racism in order to serve their own agenda. And we must all, the Institute of Race Relations, the Human Rights Commission, we must guard against that as well. We must condemn racists and we must condemn people that invent fake allegations of racism just to find an excuse for, for, for destructive behavior. Um, finally, thank you. <laughs> My last question is about the sample that is used and that you refer to. What is the composition of that sample? Who formed part of the sample for the data that, you go, that you've provided us? Um, you said most of South Africa, 80% of people, I'm assuming that's based on the sample. But I think for contextual purposes, it's important that, um, and I would request that we, we in supplementing your written the you know, written um, submissions that we provided us with a data, but for the purposes of the oral submissions, could we also just get a breakdown in terms of geography, race composition, age, and uh, yeah, uh, who forms part of the sample? Thank you. I'm very happy to go through methodology. Uh, I wanted to go through the 15 headline results. I haven't I didn't get that chance in my opening remarks, and I haven't gotten that chance in uh, the leading of evidence, which I am disappointed in. But I can use one question as an example to answer your question. So when the respondents were asked, best way, what is the best way to improve lives in South Africa? We gave four particular options. Uh, more jobs and better education, better service delivery, more BEE, and affirmative action in employment or more land reform. One of the results from that is only 3.8% of black respondents said the best way to improve lives is BEE. Only 4% said more land reform. Whereas 70, almost 72% of black respondents said the best way to improve lives is more jobs and better education. Now here, I think that's an interesting finding. But here's the problem. The precision of the numbers that I've read out can be very misleading. These results do not mean that 71.9% of South Africans think that more jobs and better education is a better way forward than BEE. Because 71.9 is an impossibly precise number. The way it works is, we ask a randomly generated sample of people which generates a statistical significance of roughly 2% with a 95% interval of confidence. So that means, using the 72% as an example, that we can be 95% confident that between 69% and 73% of black South Africans think that more jobs and better education is a better way to improve lives than more BEE. See, I've given a range there from 69 to 73, where it's 2 plus or 2 minus. And I'm saying that within that range, I'm 95% confident that that's the case. Now, in terms of that's a, a very superficial look at how to interpret statistical. Um, claims. There's always a confidence interval and there's always a range. In terms of how you generate that confidence, you look at the total sample. You, you're really trying to understand 58 million South Africans or, or 28 million adults, something like that. And within that, the breakdowns by race. You can't ask all those people, but as a matter of statistics, if things are relatively evenly distributed, you can ask a sample and get your confidence interval. Now, we don't choose the method of going out to find people. We hire different companies to do that for us. And sometimes they will go out and find people physically, and they will go door to door, and they will knock, and they will say, hello, what do you want? What do you think? Can you give us 10 minutes of your time, please, to answer these questions? Always, the questions are asked in the language of the choice 
of the respondent so that there can be no misunderstanding and no discomfort. So whatever the respondent language is, the some we do it over the so we have done various surveys almost every year since 2013. We have done surveys asking people these questions. And sometimes it's been in person, sometimes it's been over the phone. The questions have been relatively stable. Sometimes we see some changes, but the answers have been relatively stable too. Now all of this, uh, in terms of the rural urban split, it can change a little bit depending on which survey. In terms of the racial split, we always make sure to use statistical best practice to make sure that the racial um, demographics are well represented. In terms of the rich-poor split, we, we, we do so similarly. Now, if I can say one last thing, I know I'm going on, but it's very difficult, and these matters are very well resolved um, in writing, and our, our, insofar as the methodology is accessible, it's already published, but we will be very happy to include this in the We are not the only people who do polling in this country. In fact, we don't do polling in this country. We commission others to do polling. Private companies that do this as their expertise. But when others have done polling, they have found similar results. Let me read one of them to you. When Stats SA did its Governance, Public Safety and Justice Survey in 2018, it had a very large sample. Its sample was 18,970. Whereas our samples are usually only 3,000, 2,500, 2,000 thereabouts. The advantage of a bigger sample is you get a more precise answer. The range gets narrower for your 95% confidence. They asked, have you experienced uh, racial discrimination in the past two years? Remember, we asked in the last five years, and 80% said no. They said, have you experienced racial discrimination in the last two years? Only 6.8% said yes. A very small minority on their polling said they had experienced racism. So that corroborates our finding. Those two findings are very similar. And in writing, I'm happy to go through many such examples. Yeah. South African Reconciliation Barometer, surveys by the Institute for Reconciliation uh, and Justice, surveys by, by Afrobarometer, Afro surveys by, by the Institute of Security Studies, many examples. Where our answers and the answers of others are coming out quite similar, and that is just further evidence that we are that we are in fact onto something. Um, for the sake of time, commissioners, I'm not going to um, carry on. I'll hand it over to the panel. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Red. Uh, I'll now proceed to ask members of the panel to also put up. Uh, uh, questions to you with regard to this issue. Uh, Professor Mashingul. Thank you, Chair. I, <clears throat> I have a lot of questions, but I don't think they will help uh, this inquiry. The, the evidence team has already covered uh, almost everything. I just have two questions. Uh, the the service the service that you done <clears throat> that found that you know uh, most people said racism is not a problem. What is the word for racism in Afrikaans that you use there, and what is the word for racism in any other African languages? Okay, uh, because yeah, yeah, the the word racism in Sesotho in Sesotho is very interesting. So yeah, what, 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 you, you, you can look in your computer, but what word did they use in your survey uh, for, for racism in, 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 for Africans and for any other African languages? The final question, Chair, is... Can I take the questions one at a time? Or? Just two yeah. questions. Okay, okay, go ahead. Okay, yeah, let him answer this question. Okay, that's right. Um, I'd just like to make a point of clarity for the Commission's sake. Uh, the Commissioner said... Uh, that most South Africans said racism is not a problem. But I never said that. No uh, question in our survey has ever asked whether racism is a problem or is not a problem. Um, 
So under that correction, maybe the commissioner would like to ask me the question again uh, without misrepresenting either what we have said or what the survey respondents have said. What was the question that you asked in your survey? The one about race relations, what was the question? We asked several questions. The first question was, can you identify the two biggest problems in South Africa that have not been addressed since 1994? The second question was, have race relations improved since 1994? The third was, have you personally experienced any form of racism over the last five years? Yeah. The fourth the, the was... Question, yeah, the, the, the third question, how did you translate it in Africans and in, in your other African languages? Okay, I just, I, this is very important. The question is, have you personally experienced any form of racism over the past five years? The commissioner has said that the 80% who said no, we have not experienced any form of racism in the last five years, are saying racism is not a problem. This is a very serious mistake. If you say you have not personally experienced racism, that does not mean you think racism is not a problem. Mr. Kuzo, we are ready out of time. My, my question was very specific. But let's leave that question aside. Uh, Just help us. The, no. the commission said that these yes, 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 yes. Say, say that race, racism is not a problem. That, that's there fine. are two separate statements. I'm trying to draw out the difference. That's one okay. is, I have not personally experienced mm. racism. The other one is, racism is not a problem. That's okay. That's Those fine. are very, very different statements. That's I'm fine. I'm not sure if the commission understands that difference. I'd be very happy to explain that difference further. No, that's fine. That's fine. As that's as fine. the commission fine. asks us, how... How did we get to say race, race, race is not a problem? The commission, the commission is asking, asking a question, a question based, on based on a false assumption. Namely, that's okay. race, race, race is not a problem. problem. But nobody, nobody said race, race, race is not a problem. problem. That's okay. We're asking for, for, for translation. The last question, just help us understand your now, institute. Please, can the witness, Chair, can the oh, witness allow me to finish my question? Okay, yes. Please, let, let's keep our cool. The, the last question that we ask all the organization is to understand your institute better. Can you share with us the, the gender and the race of your leadership? The, the, the race and the gender of your chairperson, your CEO, your chief of staff, and your head of policy. Can you just share with us what we know the institute much more? Yeah. I don't know the race or gender of the chairperson. I avoid the board as much as I can. I can. Uh, we do not have a, a chief of staff. Um, and, and so far as the other questions go, I, I'm in two minds, but I think it would probably be appropriate for me to say that I'm not going to answer that question. Uh, again, uh, I think that it's important to know that the, the IOR has been asked to fill out uh, forms that say what is the nature of our group in terms of race, gender, sexual preference, and so on. And we have refused to do, that, do so. Um, and we've refused to do so, even though it has cost us a lot of money. People who have big banks who are happy to give us money, who said, of course, you guys would qualify with all the BEE criteria, given the diversity of your staff. Just, Just fill it out. And we said, and we no, said no, we will not, we will not fill it out on principle. On principle. What is that principle? non-racialism. You will learn nothing about the nature of the IRR by knowing what my race is. And so I will not tell you in this context as a representative of the IRR what my race is. That's okay. Thank you, Chair. You don't have further questions? Uh, nothing at all. Thank you. Professor uh, Commissioner Zbanyoni. Uh, thank you, Chairperson. Mr. Crozer, the South African race relations existed, existed even before 1994. When was it established? It was established in 1929. Second question. Without going into all its uh, objectives and aims, uh, briefly, how would you uh, describe 
as its aims and objectives? What did it stand for? I think the best way to judge that is to look at, look at track, track record. So the IRR has always been open to members of all races. It, is, it has had leadership through the years, through the darkest, darkest days of apartheid, of all races. It has always refused to adhere to the race laws. And sometimes its membership was harassed by the police and sometimes jailed for refusing to adhere to the race laws of apartheid South Africa. It scrutinized every aspect of apartheid, from detention without trial to the denial of property rights to black South Africans, to the disenfranchisement of, um, of everyone excepting white South Africans, it tried to make sure of one very simple thing. Apartheid was evil, and in history, we know what happens when evil reigns. Some people sit back and they say, we didn't know. That is why we did nothing about it. The IRR's mission, first and foremost, was to make sure nobody could say they Right. Will I be correct to say, if my memory serves me well, among other things that the race relations did in the past, it offered bursaries? It did offer bursaries, and we've heard of many of the members, members who were financially, financially supported, supported in order to, to, to further their education. education. Uh, I, think I think many South Africans will know some, know some of them and be proud of them. them. For example, uh, Lesetja. Governor of Bank, Bank, for example, Nelson Mandela, the first president, president of, of South, South Africa, Africa small small race 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 race. Race. Yes, I, I'm, I'm not trying to uh, repeat the question uh, that was asked by the evidence leaders, but uh, surely, uh, Mr. Krauser, if you are asked what is the composition, the racial composition of, of the South African race relations, what harm will there just to give I, a rough explanation? I, I'm, I'm happy to say that uh, we have um, racially a very diverse composition. That we have, we have uh, in terms of gender, 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 we have diversity. In terms of, in terms sexual, of sexual preference, we have diversity. And that, and that uh, we, never we never went, went to, to look out, out for people the on the basis to cherry pick do window dressing. We are firmly opposed to that. Um, it is just in our nature to be open to, 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 to all members who are willing to work hard to try to further non-racialism in South Africa. Um, going beyond that, to, to for me to now racially qualify the CEO and the, um, I can't even remember the name of the other position that was mentioned. Uh, strikes me as uh, getting to that point of, of quotarizing, of tokenizing. So I can say our general attitude is non-racial and that anyone who walks into our offices will see that. Uh, but, uh, but if you want to know what race is the CEO, I would invite the commission to, if I'm going to talk about individuals now, it makes me feel uncomfortable. The commission is welcome to look on our website and make their own judgment as to what race he is. I will just say as a final matter, it is, it, is, it, is it is a difficult thing to, to identify, identify another person by race, by race they, they have not volunteered, volunteered their race. Their race. So, so the, the philosopher David, David Benatar, who is the head of, the, head of, of uh, the, the philosophy department of UCT, he prefers, he prefers not, not to identify, identify himself, himself by, race. by race. If you look if at you the look head of policy, policy at, the at the Democratic Alliance, Alliance Gwen and Gwenya, Gwen and Gwenya refuses to identify herself by race. She says when there's a form where she has to fill out her race, she will rather close her eyes and drop the, the pen where it lands. And she put out a tweet showing where it landed on Indian. One day it landed on something like that. She just fills it out like that. Other people might feel comfortable to, to say, you are this race, even if the person is not coming forward like that. I don't, I don't feel comfortable with that. For me, for me if, if someone, someone has, has that position, it is not for me to go around and, and apply some kind of pencil test. It is for people to, to determine their own identities and their own way of being perceived. It is for me to try to respect that. Now, my problem is I've never asked the CEO what race he is. So I'm not sure how he would want to identify. Maybe he has a, he has a philosophy, philosophy like Gwen and Gwenya uh, and David Benatar. Maybe he has a 
has a philosophy, like most people who are very comfortable to say the obvious thing, it is likely that it's the second one. It is most, it is most likely, likely that it's would just say what Racy is. But I don't, but I don't know because I've never, I've never asked him. It strikes it me, strikes me I, I, I've, never I've never thought to ask him. Yes. I, I tend to agree with you because it's still a, a challenge. Some people are even saying the population, the population Registration Act needs to be amended because it still requires people to uh, classify themselves uh, in terms of the uh, uh, situation that was existing prior to, to 1994. Yes, we, we, we worry about that. We worry about the fact that um, it seems almost as if the apartheid classifications live on in a ghostly form in our legislation. It's, of course, the, the, the Registration Act was repealed in the early 90s, but the effect is still there in the way that census questions are framed, in the way that uh, various race laws require people to be identified. Um, I don't know how to deal with it. Of course, at the Institute of Race Relations, I benefit from the fact that when we ask our surveys, people are asked to identify themselves by race. They can refuse to do so. But most say what their race is, and then we report those figures. 80% of black respondents say this, 60% of white respondents say that, 40% of colored respondents say this. So we are also using this classification system, but we will never force it on anyone. It is only when people opt in. And I don't know what would be best for the future. Maybe it would be best for the future if this system of classification is eroded by the sands of time and by the voluntary exchanges of goodwill, uh, where people are on the same soccer team or the same rugby team or the same work force or the same uh, church club, and it's not important what color you are, it's important what do you share as human beings. Uh, maybe one day that will make hmm. the question meaningless. Yes. F from your uh, answers that you have given, I assume, correct me if I'm wrong, you made an example of Mgwenya that shows that there are, if I, I may use the old terms, black people in the, human, in the, in the race relations organizations, also using the old terms, uh, uh, white people as well as Indians and colors. Of course, uh, yeah, yes, uh, Gwen and Gwenya was with the Institute of Race Relations. Uh, she is no longer with the Institute of Race Relations, uh, but there are um, black people, white people, colored people, Indian people uh, that I work with on a, on a daily basis at the Institute of Race Relations. Thank you. We are making good progress, uh, Mr. Krauser. I'm learning to I answer hope, much more quickly. <laughs> I hope we will not change when I'm asking you now this question, but uh, maybe the last part one question. Swas Reinerche, you 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 said the teacher separated uh, learners amongst blacks, one side, and uh, white, uh, another side. Are, are you not 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 uh, you personally, but is the race relations regarding that as not uh, depicting what was the situation in the past? By the past, I mean the prior to 1994, that uh, Group Areas Act was, not, was mm -hmm. not allowing people to, to mix based on racial classification. I think this is a good question because it highlights something that must be very difficult for the Commission, which is to distinguish between outcomes and process. Mm -hmm. So in an advert, it might be the case that the outcome is uh, four people are pictured in the ad and they are all black and the commission might be told that this means the, ra the ad is racist because there has been no inclusion of Indians or whites or coloreds. Of course the commission would not jump to the conclusion that it is racist. They would want to know maybe what is the procedure, what is the explanation and this is the law. This is the law under Papuda and this is the law under the con Constitution that it is necessary 
to understand discrimination, to understand the process. So what happened in Streisarenica, in brief, brief looked, looked like the teacher, the teacher had, had said white and black, and black must be separate. In fact, what, what had happened was the, was the teacher had said, said this is the very first day of school, and the children that have a first language of, I believe it was Sutu, and the children that have a first language of Afrikaans uh, will find themselves comfortably, specifically the children that are first language Sutu, will find themselves comfortably together while the first bit is being explained of the day. Because the teacher found that there was a student who could speak well English and Afrikaans and could help with translation, just to manage the meet and greet. Then within half an hour, the students had already been mixed by race into a different pattern. The meet and greet had been established. The teacher had established who can understand what, who can help what with communication. You must remember these are very young children, five years old. So it's difficult to establish who can understand what. Once she established everyone can understand everything, she mixed them immediately. Now, the, the, one of the allegations that emerged at the time was that the second picture that came out, first there was the picture that looked like apartheid. Then the second picture came out with the kids mixed. There was an allegation, no, the teacher heard that it was going viral on social media, that she is splitting her children like this. So now she is artificially mixing them and taking a photo just to create the impression that she is an enlightened person, just to distract from the fact that she started in this wrong way. In order to understand, was that true or was that false, I had to go into the timestamps. But more importantly, I had to go into the history. This is one morning. I had to go into the history. Last year, that same teacher had many black students. I had to ask, how were they being treated? Because it is very easy to judge someone. In one moment, I think we can all uh, seem to be in the wrong in various ways. Mm. But judging for a whole year, when those teachers, when those parents came to me, and they spoke to me quietly, they were afraid. When they spoke to me and they said, this woman has given extra time to our children to help them in aftercare, to understand the language better, even helping some of the parents. Some of them were foreigners to, to understand how to get their um, post office things working. It, it struck me that uh, the big picture was more important than the small picture. And once again, I think the same thing is in play with the Equality Court judgment on the Theresa May Hair ad. I'm moving towards uh, my last question. The judgment that you referred to in the High Court of South Africa, Western Cape Division, Cape Town, sitting as an equality court, the equality court judgment, it's 39 uh, pages. I, I assume that you've read the whole judgment or your legal department might have read the whole judgment. I have read the whole judgment and I and I have spoken to legal experts who've read the whole judgment. You didn't only read the uh, last where it says the order that the order I grant is therefore the following the application is dismissed. No. No uh, that is why earlier I quoted my favorite part which is uh, um, listed as paragraph 75, I'll just read the first two sentences. An objective, dispassionate and contextual assessment of the impugned advertisement does not support the applica applicant's contentions. On the original advertisement, the six images appear below a banner that shows a black woman with a beautiful Afro hair side by side with a woman who appears to be Caucasian supporting, sporting beautiful flowing hair. And then the judge goes on to say, unfortunately, in the social media, that part of the advert was cropped out. And yes. this is what created the misapprehension. Absolutely. I, I wanted to come to that. Okay. The, the judge emphasized cropped up, yes. not the, 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 the original. But and we can all understand. Case, hey? yeah, Sorry. But being the, that being the case, Pigs uh, had already apologized and said that uh, uh, they apologize. In other words, after thought, they realized that uh, it uh, was an advert that they, they should not have uh, approved to be to be published. 
Right, and and so my position is, is similar, I think, to the court's position in the sense that I I see when I see the full advert that it was uh, not a racist advert, um, and I see also the cropped version seems quite outrageous and certainly caused an outrage, and then I wonder how to reconcile these facts given the events which succeeded things. Two points. One point is that a business has many reasons to say that an advert was not a good advert. One of those reasons can just simply be business. They make the business judgment that uh, if they say, I'm sorry, this will put them in the best position to continue to sell the most products. Of course, it's the nature of advertising. You know, everyone is saying, this drink is the best, that drink is the best, this car is the best. It's not necessarily the case that they believe that. They are saying what they hope the customer wants to hear. Maybe it's the case that that ap apology was not sincere. Alternatively, maybe it's the case that the apology was sincere and ill-conceived. It might be that those at clicks who made the apology were basing their apology on the cropped image and not on the original. That they saw the cropped image and they thought that is a wrong thing to do, that is a bad thing to do, and ended up taking responsibility for it, even though they were not the ones who created it. I think, uh, I think it's hard to tell. It is uh, clearly the case that um, the, the holding company, which in fact was found to be the wrong kind of company to challenge, um, had uh, put up a defense. And it's also clearly the case that Tresemme put up a defense. I beg your pardon, smile on. Uh, had put up a defense. Um, and that defense involved reference both to the content of the original advert and reference to the process by which they'd gotten there. Uh, and I think for the be benefit of the commission and the public, it's, it's important to know that they started out with um, the same text that people are familiar with. Normal hair, dry and frizzy hair, fine and flat hair, and so on and so forth. And all of the models were white. Then someone came in and said, you better change that so that not all of the models are white because we are trying to uh, be more inclusive. Then they had both a white and a black woman modeling for naturally the best, which is the bit that I've read out. And then they also had uh, a black woman uh, adver advertising or modeling for the dry and frizzy, and then a white woman for fine and flat. Now, fine and flat and dry and frizzy are not compliments. The idea there is that you are buying a product to deal with this problem to improve things. Uh, but the idea that, um, that Tresemme believed only black people have this problem is clearly refuted by the fact that the original advert had a white woman with, fine and, uh, with dry and frizzy hair. Because, of course, there are some white women who have a problem of dry and frizzy hair. In fact, I can tell you, my hair, I need to use a shampoo for dry and frizzy hair. Uh, okay. So it's not really a matter of race. It's just a matter of uh, uh, circumstance. Yeah, OK. We are running out of time. Uh, my last question is, do you agree that uh, racism is wrong and there is a need to talk about it, to speak about it, and also where it uh, rests its head? There needs to be an action taken against that. Absolutely. I agree that uh, racism is morally wrong. I believe that the more racism occurs, the harder it is for decent South Africans to get ahead. In my definition of racism, it is possible for any member of any race to be racist. And I implore the Commission to give its definition of racism so we can see is it only one race who can be racist or all races can be racist. That is an important debate in South Africa. And I think it's important that we come to a consensus about is racism a thing only some people can do 
or is it something anyone can do if they're exerting power and they're discriminating on the basis of race? I think that my final comment is racism is wrong and it must be stopped. And so must race hustling. Race hustling is our word for, for when people do that thing of, of inventing a situation, of making a fake allegation of racism, of inventing racism where there was no racism in order to disguise their own problems. And my reference again is to the fact that our surveys show the majority of South Africans agree that politicians sometimes do this thing of exaggerating racism to hide their own failures in terms of employment, crime, corruption, and so on and so forth. So we must okay. check both things, racism and fake allegations of racism. Let's stop there, Mr. Thank Koza. You. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Zbanyone. Uh, perhaps uh, <coughs> the last uh, question for myself. Okay. <coughs> you know, the I want again to quote paragraph 11 as I've asked other witnesses before you. Uh, paragraph 11 of the terms of reference is that uh, the intended outcome of this inquiry is to establish a genuine culture of human rights and prevent discriminatory adverts which unfairly depict, discriminate, and impair the dignity of the diverse people in South Africa. Can you just uh, perhaps uh, uh, tell, uh, tell us how do you think that uh, your organization can help the commission in trying to reach this outcome? How can your organization, I mean, uh, which is uh, very active, tell us how it can help us in reaching the, the outcome that we want? And can second question uh, also um, tell us how you think that uh, social cohesion, which is something that the Commission is pursuing, can help us perhaps uh, uh, you are, whether your company believes in social cohesion. So these are the two questions. Um, is, there, is there any chance I could look at the terms of reference? Yes. Do you have a... Yeah, go to six, uh, uh, paragraph 11. Can you put it, somebody put it perhaps, uh, give it to the witness? Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. And please concentrate on paragraph 11 because my question is based on question 11. Uh, th th Paragraph 11, sorry. Thank you. I, I am looking at that paragraph. Um, uh, let me just repeat it because I think it's so well framed. Oh, yes. The reason for the investigation and the intended outcome is to establish a genuine culture of human rights and prevent discriminatory adverts which unfairly depict, discriminate, and impair the dignity of the diverse people living in South Africa. I implore the Commission to considering the possibility that insofar as the second half of that sentence goes, namely to prevent discriminatory adverts which unfairly depict, discriminate, and impair the dignity of the diverse people living in South Africa, that insofar as that goes, the Human Rights Commission considers at least the possibility of saying mission accomplished. If it is the case that the five ads in the terms of reference are the most egregious examples of racism in advertising in this country, and if it is the case that none of them are in fact racially discriminatory, then it must be the case that out of the tens of millions of flighted ads, none could be found that are overtly racist. If that is the case, I implore the Commission to consider the possibility of saying 
Well done. We and the Commission are in a similar position where we fight against injustice. And so, in a sense, our existence and our irrelevance is directly correlated to how much injustice there is. In other words, one day you could, I certainly hope one day there's no need for the Institute of Race Relations. I hope that one day things are going so well that there's just no need. Of course the Human Rights Commission can never reach that point. There are so many problems in South Africa. There will always be problems in South Africa and they will always impinge on human rights. So you will always have work to do. Nevertheless, and in fact precisely for that reason, sometimes it is good to say this job has been done. Now, relating to the first part, to establish a genuine culture of human rights, as I was saying, in some regards, I think many South Africans, the majority, 80%, already value one another by, by, by the true principles that bind humans together, and particularly that bind South Africans together, according to Chapter 1 of the Constitution. Non-racialism, non-sexism, and so on. Unfortunately, we have gross human rights violations in this country. And, and there remains much to do. And that takes me to the question, how can we help you? We are happy to be the only ones who come, who say maybe mission accomplished is the thing to say about a narrow subsector. We are also happy to engage in a case-by-case -case analysis of impugned uh, speech acts, whether it's advertising or whether it's other speech acts, or even whether it's other incidents. We have some expertise, and humbly, we would like to help. Uh, we, we have actually reached out to many schools, public and private, where there have been racial tensions, because Schweizer Reinecke is one example where things worked out one way. Other examples, it seems to me clear that there was racism. And there must be mediation. And there must be people that come out with a new mentality. And we are very, we are very eager, eager. We are very, we are very eager, eager to help, to help, that, help process that process along. And so far as the Human Rights, Rights Commission is engaged in that process, we are very, very happy to help. And my and last, last point will be, in terms of, in terms of how, how we can help. help. I, think I think we can help, help the Commission also by pushing this idea of limited government. Of course, there is a natural tension, the Commission being an organ of Chapter 9 of the Constitution. We, as a civil society organization, it is our role to say, please don't forget about the small South Africans that are easily overlooked. Please remember that the millions and millions of South Africans who work together, who play together, who have come to really make non-racialism a part of their life, that they ultimately are the most powerful force for taking us forward. And so sometimes the temptation from the Commission might be to step in with an iron fist, to strangle something, to, stra to pull out a weed with an iron fist that can end up disrupting the whole garden. When if you leave it to South Africans that are already there at the grassroots, they will do the jobs themselves. They will refuse to buy that product being sold by a racist. They will rather buy the other product. They will insult that person until that person changes his mind. And so on and so forth. We believe in free speech. Because, because we believe in South Africans. That doesn't mean there's no role for the government. Of course not. We are very, very, very glad that the Human Rights Commission has the mandate that it does. Um, and, and, and we would like to help it further its endeavors within, within that context of us trying to stand up and say some of the work has already been done and some of the work will be done by ordinary South Africans with or without the government and maybe better without the government because that way you can see it is truly voluntary. That way you can see it is not forced. It is just a reflection of what people already want and already believe and are already able to do. Okay, perhaps uh, my follow-up question will be that uh, uh, 
Will you agree with us and why you see the South African Human Rights Commission following and pursuing uh, the method of uh, trying to get things right through social cohesion is that uh, we have noticed that there are many, many, many unreported and subtle, subtle uh, adverts which are, you know, discriminatory and uh, which we believe uh, could be perhaps uh, uh, remedied by way of uh, social cohesion, that we start there with the social cohesion. Um, I'd, I'd like to answer the question, uh, but I think I might be able to answer it better if I understand better what is meant by social cohesion. Okay. Social cohesion, you know, according to us, and, uh, you know, is trying to have the two groups two groups of people, or more than two groups of people, you know, the diverse uh, group of people, to understand each other better, because we believe if they understand each, each other better, then uh, they will respect each other, and uh, they will, uh, you know, see to it that uh, they don't depict other people or other groups, you know, or take other groups as, uh, you know, substandard or, uh, you know, uh, put it better, substandard or, uh, you know, uh, less people, less a people. Mm. That's right. So I don't know if I... So, so, so I will say... I... I think by way of an example, I can say where I think that it probably is the case um, that I would urge the commission to, to let exactly that process of social cohesion uh, develop organically uh, just by voluntary private exchange. There was an advert uh, that I'm sure the commission is aware of um, where an advertising company said of itself, uh, we are 100% black owned. Um, this was in 2017. I think a complaint was made to the ASA, which then became the ARB. And the ASA said, uh, this ad is fine because it is an accomplishment to be 100% black. It is, a, it, is a, it is a good point to advertise. This is a value add proposition that you are exclusively black. Now, if I look at um, Judge Albi Sachs, uh, who was a former constitutional court justice, I look at his comments in the judgment uh, to which I earlier referred. He said that at the very least, and I'm paraphrasing here, at the very least equality between races should mean more or less what you were saying. It should never mean exclusivity. It should never mean one race is so far down that it's better to have no one from that race at all. It can never be good to say that white people are so low that you are, you are the best just because you completely exclude them. Or Indian people are so low, you are the best because you completely exclude them. Or colored people are so low, you are the best because you completely exclude them. Now, I would be fascinated to see what the Human Rights Commission's opinion is of that advert. Uh, and you were making reference to adverts that are not in the terms of reference that have been displayed, displayed in the relevant period. period. And of course, and of course that advert was complained to the ASA, so, so it's in the relevant ambit. But even that ad, which to my mind, to my mind, is, uh, is, is worth criticism on the basis of, 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 of its racial nature. Even that advert, I would not want anyone to ban such an advert. I would not want anyone to, as a government institution, force such an advert off the side of the highway. Because if someone with a business wants to say, my business is better,
because it excludes people in ownership or, or operation of other races. I believe that ordinary South Africans will eventually deal with that. And I think that ordinary South Africans will ultimately deal with it better. That social cohesion, exactly as you were saying, different groups getting together, understanding one another better. I think that happens most of the time more seamlessly when it is voluntary and private. Because the challenge for the commission is that with its power ultimately backed by the police, there comes a point where it's no longer a conversation. If someone is fined or someone goes to jail, that is not a conversation. That is an exercise of force. So I, I, I celebrate the commission's commitment to social cohesion uh, in, in ways that do not include fines and police, where it includes conversation and opinions and information and exchanges. And as far as I can tell, that is what is taking place at this inquiry. Um, and so I think that is very good. It is very good to ventilate these issues um, and discuss them, because obviously people do have different points of view. And although it doesn't often happen, it might even be the case that the opportunity I've been afforded to argue for non-racialism in the way I understand it, will have persuaded someone in the, in the public or in the commission, and then I will be, 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 be very glad. I will have felt like I've done my job. Even if it's one person in the public, that's, uh, that's, that's, I think that's important. We are all important as South Africans. Thank you, Mr. Cruiser. And then uh, I'm now inviting the evidence leaders uh, to pose any follow-up questions, if there, are, if there are any, to Mr. Cruiser. Uh, Chairperson, we don't have any further questions. Thank you. Panelists? No further questions? No further questions from me, Chairperson. Professor? Nothing for me. Thank you, Chair. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, let me now, at this stage, uh, thank you, Mr. Cruiser, for having presented yourself to this uh, inquiry. Uh, we value uh, your, 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 your contribution and uh, the inputs that you have made this morning. So once more, thank you very much. Thank you. And at this stage, I would like uh, to uh, excuse you from the stand. And uh, <coughs> once more, thank you. Okay. Very good. Thank you so much. Do we still have... Uh, okay. Shall we take a... a break now for 10 minutes before we call the last witness. Thank you, Chair. Okay.
much? What time is it now? It's 15.54. It's now 15.54. And uh, we are proceeding again with our inquiry. And uh, the third witness for the day is on the stand. And uh, I would like to the thank you for having presented yourself uh, this afternoon. And uh, for your benefit, uh, I just want to introduce the members of the panel. Okay, I'm Vukan <coughs> Malachi. I'm the chairperson of this uh, panel. And then we have... Uh, Commissioner Banyoni, who is also a member of the panel, and Professor Malinguzi, who is also uh, the third member of the panel. And then we've got also the team leaders. So before we can start, uh, I'm going to hand over to Commissioner Banyoni so that he says you in. Thank you, Chairperson. We are dealing with the be true to me, the Anne Walker. How should we address you? Yen, perfect. Yen. Yen, thank you. Right. Uh, let me just explain that uh, before a witness testifies, we establish whether or not there is a an objection towards taking the or the prescribed oath, and then if there is an objection, there is an option of an affirmation. May I find out from your side here? Yeah? No objection, objection from our side. Right. For record purposes, can you uh, state your full names, please? It's Leanne Lauren Walker. Thank you. Do you swear that uh, the evidence? that you will give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. If that is the case, then raise your right hand and say, so help me God. So help me God. Thank you, Chairperson. They, they have uh, duly sworn in. The evidence leaders have not introduced themselves. OK, thank you. Uh, will the evidence leaders uh, introduce yourself? To the witness. Thank you, Chairperson. My name is Amandu Mampegi. And my name is Buan Jones. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you. So I see we are a little bit uh, behind time. I'll immediately hand over to the evidence leaders to put questions and questions of clarifications to the witness. Thank you. Thank you, Chairperson. Um, Leanne, please provide us with your background. Right. Um, I'm a trans woman. I represent an organization, Be True To Me. I'm the founder and executive director. And I yeah, have a passion for the, the community. Thank you, Leanne. Um, <clears throat> I will now provide you with an opportunity to take us through your presentation. Thank you. So, as I said, I um, represent an organization. It's a nonprofit called Be True To Me. We focus on supporting gender diverse and transgender individuals here in South Africa and in the region. Uh, we also do consulting advocacy work um, and provide peer support groups within the community. Um, I am, as I said, a trans woman, passionate about the community, have many years experience in nonprofits. Um, I'm a geek as well, so uh, technology doesn't scare me. So one thing I wanted to get started with, um, just so we understand each other, um, You've all heard the alphabet soup, the LBGTIQ, Q plus community. Um, and just want to say, we're talking about lesbian, bi, gay, 
um, trans, intersex, queer, questioning, etc. So there's a lot of letters. But I'd rather like to have this notion of SOGI SC, um, where we look at sexual orientation, gender identity, gender expression, and your sexual characteristics. Um, think about orientation, about who do I want to go to bed with? Um, or I'm attracted to, or I don't want to go to bed with anyone. Gender identity, who do I go to bed as? So it doesn't involve anyone else. So there's always this notion of um, mixing up gender identity with sexual orientation. I just always want to make sure we're on the same thing. Expression, just how do I present dress, mannerisms, etc. And that doesn't have to be interconnected. And then characteristics is when you're starting to look at reproductive organs, genitalia, etc. So just keep that in the, the back of your head. So we've, we're given a short period of time to prepare for this commission, um, and we did a quick community engagement last week and had a fruitful two-hour conversation um, with the community. And within that representation, there were two people who are in the advertising industry um, and sort of spoke from that perspective as well, as well as community people who interact with media um, and receive their advertising or content. Um, what clearly stood out for me was there's an international component of advertising, something that you'll pick up in YouTube or Facebook, Etc. So it's not just a content that's to other people, but yeah, <coughs> Twitter, all our social media has an international, but there's also South African advertising within those platforms. Um, and often adverts are targeted, especially when we start to look at social media companies, um, and and so that can create discomfort for community where your social media might th think you're a different gender to how you really identify, et cetera. Um, the other thing that also came out is that products are gendered um, and gender focused. So for the trans community, they often feel that they excluded from certain products. Um, there's also a, a feeling, and I'm going to use the term rainbow washing, um, where when companies look at being inclusive, it's sort of a token washing as opposed to being genuine about their representation. Um, Pride Month is one of the big times we see rainbow washing, where companies come out with uh, advertising targeted to uh, the SOGI community, but not really engaged with them. Something that we also picked up is pronouns um, within advertising, that everything is limited to a he and her. Um, so people who identify as non-binary also have a pronoun of they or them. Um, and so... A lot of adverts are targeted to either men or women and don't consider that there's more in the spectrum of gender. Um, the big one is obviously stereotyping, um, where men bra, women cook, um, boys play with cars, girls play with dolls. Um, so there's always these stereotypical advertising that's not always aligned. Um, the other thing that came out was a lot of sexism in, within adverts, um, mansplaining, um, and then belittling. Um, there was a, an advert for one of the Buckies, I think it was Mazda, where they like, I identify as a Bucky. Um, and a lot of the trans community saw that as sort of like an insult to people who, who really embrace their identity. Um, that if you identifying that it's not being belittled, but rather that's your lived reality. <coughs> the other thing is that advertising creates 
social norm, norms or social acceptance. Um, and so a lot of the media creates this atmosphere um, as well as advertising backing that up of what is normal, what is acceptable. Um, and, and we just need to keep that in the back of your minds um, that we're not trying to create stuff that's, I don't want to say abnormal, but that we can use advertising to great acceptance with within society of a very divided community or rejected community in some cases. Um, the other community comment was advertising is neutral or safe, um, seldom edgy, um, and so adverts don't necessarily address um, social norms or social issues. I mean, Nando's is an exception to the rule where they do take things on. Um, but, and we would like to see more of those kind of um, advertising. Um, advertising is pushed towards a cis-heteronormative family, um, that there's a mom and a dad, that there aren't single parents, there aren't um, trans parents, there aren't um, gay parents. So, so that's something that we also picked up on, um, that there's discrimination and ridicule um, of community um, and, and this isn't right and it, it is protected by the Bill of Rights and the Constitution. So the question is, what I ask the community is, how would you like to see yourselves in adverts? And the first thing came in, we're normal human beings and treat us like that. We are cool, we are awesome, um, and we are visible. Um, and we don't want to be seen invisible either. Um, yeah, the other one is to be more than, you know, one of the advertisers said that the easiest way to token an advert is have a, an LBGTIQ plus person with blue hair and a nose ring. Um, and we want to see more of that stereotypical kind of tokening within adverts. Um, and also that we can blend in um, to to adverts. You know, take if if you're having a supermarket ad and somebody's standing in a queue, just include a trans person in that um, kind of thing. And and also to have broad spectrum. Um, everyone sort of thinks trans sort of things men in dresses, where if we look at especially in South Africa but around the world. Um, the intersectionality of trans people is those that were assigned female at birth, those assigned male at birth, and it's pretty much equal um, in, in terms of numbers. So, so trans men are, are just as real as trans women, um, and non-binary people also exist, and we need to stop the focus on trans women um, specifically. Um, the other comment is. There's intersectionality across the community, um, and that includes people with disabilities or or life challenges, and there's very little representation of those in the community being represented in adverts, um, and that's something else we would like to see. There were three wonderful, or four wonderful quotes that I just wanna say. Um, I would like to see the media representing the human condition in a more realistic light. We all exist, fat, thin, blind, seen, women with beards, men with periods. Show us everything, not just the pretty white, thin people who have money. Um, the other one is punch up, don't punch down, and you know, Nando's comes to mind with that. Um, where, where you can actually take on social conversations in a positive way, not pushing people down, but uplifting. Um, what will the product and service do for me as a trans person? It's often a question that gets asked. Um, as I said, don't forget my pronouns. Um, that was also in there. A couple things that we picked up from uh, advertising industry um, that there's sort of a couple camps um, of a very corporate industry and, and more edgy 
Um, and so a lot of your bigger companies use your corporate advertising houses uh, that your senior leadership um, are often older cis white men, um, males, um, and, and so transformation for um, gender and race um, in senior leadership is still a challenge with, within the industry. Um, advertisers intentionally discriminate in ads um, that they find themselves doing through ignorance and carelessness. People making and approving our ads are commonly oblivious to the harm that they're doing, lack of experience and mentoring of junior staff. Um, uh, and so there's a lot of lack of mentoring happening um, with juniors. Uh, a lot of lack of diversity in training within the industry, um, especially when it comes to decision making. Um, and one of the other big challenges are clients who are commissioning adverts. Um, their briefs are, are often challenging um, and not sufficient. Um, and so those are problematic, that clients' briefings to the industry needs to also be addressed, um, and hopefully the Commission can take that on as well. Some ideas um, is for the community to work with the education institutions, um, advertising schools, to make sure they have a wider understanding of diversity. Um, we encourage that the leadership within the industry um, continue to upskill, um, especially within diversity. Um, and to have a look at an ad approval process for both the clients and um, the advertisers that is acceptable. Um, and, and so guidelines that are practical for the industry should be there. Um, consequences for advertisers that lack diversity uh, should be looked at. Um, I'm one of the people in the industry spoke about in the UK um, that there is some consequential advertising there. Um, if the Commission can look into that, I don't have the knowledge of that, but I did find that interesting. Um, so one of our other suggestions is to say, let's consult the community when advertising is targeting or representing a, suit, a certain group to ensure fair representation. And for this to be broad, not just one person's experience. Um, so often what happens is if you're in a advertising creative team, if there is a trans person or a gay person or they, that they sort of taken as the benchmark um, in, in the conversation. And sometimes that isn't sufficient. Um, and, and so the commission should really encourage the industry to, to look at more broader, broader consultation. Um, for diversity to be rewarded um, within the industry uh, and look at ways to include diversity without making a picture perfect. Let it be real. Let's show people struggles. Um, and, and I'm including the trans community there. The two other concerns that came out is transgender, gender diverse people intersect uh, various stages of life. It intersects race, it intersects culture, um, education levels, economic backgrounds, social standings. And so it is always hard to, to when you represent in a community, that it is a very broad community with a lot of intersectionality. Um, the other one is gender diverse people do break social constructs, um, cultural constructs, and we need to ensure that the backlash doesn't attack us as people. Um, and, and so I think cultural appropriation can be a challenge um, within the industry, uh, and that's a very broad conversation to be had. That's my notes as I've had it, so thank you. Thank you very much, Leanne. <clears throat> so um, 
I'm just going to pose some questions based on your presentation. Um, in the beginning of your presentation, um, you spoke to us about the difference between um, using the term SOGI and the LGBTQI plus term. Why is that important to know the difference according to your experience? So, so the LBGTIQ is we're looking at from the LBG, your sexual orientation, um, your trans and intersex people, which is looking at gender identity, um, your queer and your questioning, um, are people who are on a journey. Um, and, and so it's a whole lot of groupings stuck together. Um, when we start looking at uh, expression, that falls outside of the LBGTIQ uh, mm. kind of things. So how you dress for argument's sake. Um, and, and then your sexual <coughs> characteristics um, definitely come into play. Intersex people who, who have um, characteristics that not are atypical male or female, they may be inclusive of um, more of the characteristics. And, and those characteristics aren't only genitalia, it's about reproductive organs, hormone levels, um, etc. So I was asking, um, why, why, why is it important for one to know the distinction um, if there is, why, 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 um, why emphasize the distinction in terms of terminology? So the, the, the a <coughs> lot of the time is that there's a confusion between what a gay person is and a trans person is. Um, and being in the LBGT, it's all sort of mixed together. <laughs> so it's very careful to, to make sure that people who identify in the trans and the gender diverse spectrum, we're not just talking about who you're attracted to, but who I am as a person and how I identify. Okay. <clears throat> then um, following that, then my question would be, um, does language for the community matter and why? Um, it's a question of terminology, and as we uh, had alluded earlier on a question of, as you had alluded on a question of pronouns. So what is the significance of language for the community? Language is, you know, a, a, a lot of the time um, advertising and conversations are in English. Um, and, and so we live in a country with 11 official languages. Um, and so language is important um, and understanding. Um, I, I love, um, if, if you look at some languages um, in Europe where um, one of, I think it was German, where a bridge has got a, a muscular male kind of meaning, where in Spanish it's more of, you know, being pretty and those kind of things. So language definitely has its place. Language is also interpreted differently and understood differently, and different words mean different things for different people, um, and different stages as well within in your life. So language is important, and understanding that language isn't going to be the same for every person, and every person can receive differently. Then how would the, understanding that language is broad even for the community itself, how would the um, advertising sector be able to accommodate all of that in, let's say, one advert, acknowledging the complexity of language? How would the, the, uh, the agency X be able to incorporate all of that into, uh, uh, incorporate that recognition into a particular advert? So I think what the, the agencies definitely need to look at who their target audience is, who they're addressing. And, and to make sure that the language that they're using um, in that context is appropriate for, for, for the target. Uh, and that may differ. Um, again, community consultation is really important. Um, <coughs> that different communities may see it differently. Okay. If there is a particular what, okay, if there's a particular advert, let's say an advert for a deodorant, and in this advert there is um, 
woman X, size X, um, and she's putting on deodorant, and then after the deodorant, she runs to work. Um, she gets to work, and she conquers her day, and then comes back, and she has not... Um, <laughs> she has not perspired in this day over a certain um, period of time. Would act what, what let's say the let's say that is the brief and uh, presented by the agency uh, to the client. What would we contribute to? Um, what how would we better enhance this particular advert to be uh, to include um, the community? What we, how would we add to it to make sure that? Um, the community is represented. A quick brief advert I could think of at the top of my head. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I'm on the spot having to come up with an advert there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's very much to make sure that you know that the products are there to work for 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 people and for for different body types for different context, and so that people are represented, and and that it's not only. <coughs> For a woman, but you know, it could be a non-binary person, um, you know, that could be going around and running around and and and, you know, needing protection kind of thing from. Okay. Um, and you just said now that representation representation matters in this context. Um, we could add a non uh, a non-binary. Uh, a person, uh, do you have maybe um, a global t context of how um, in other com in other international communities uh, how represent how the community is represented, and maybe are there best practices that um, you've identified from um, an international market? And then I'll ask a separate time about a global uh, and national. But is there an international advert that you've thought of that? Yeah, I, I think one t um, kind of context I, I, I have there where, um, you know, even voiceovers don't have to be necessarily um, gendered or, or male or female uh, kind of thing. And, and so that your, your pe people doing um, voiceovers could, could be um, represented of, of the community. And... And even just using the the community um, is validating to say I'm using a non-binary person as a, a voiceover or something um, it is kind of also important to representation. It's not always necessarily what it looks like or what it sounds like, but the fact that there's representation and inclusion of of trans and gender diverse people. And um, do you do you have maybe a break, a best? Okay, let me start. Do you have maybe an, uh, an example of what should not be done in from a local context, and what should be done from a local context that works? That is a good sample of both. Something that what shouldn't be done is using actors or voiceover artists to represent the community who aren't part of the community. Uh, that that's a given, and, and we've seen that in in the media as well, um, in TV or, or, or movies. So, so make sure that you're using the correct community um, in your representation. Um, to be fair um, to, to the community, um, and also, you know, going, going back is not that you have to be stereotypical of what a, a man looks like or what a woman looks like. So if, you, if we are taking a trans woman, um, they don't have to be in makeup. They don't have to be wearing high heels. They can kind of be wearing flat shoes and you know, they don't have to be in dresses. Or a trans man can just uh, go around um, kind of thing. But again, a trans woman could have beard growth uh, kind of thing. And so... Yeah, and, and a trans man obviously can bleed, um, so sanitary products are, are vital and, and they need those products. So so be inclusion inclusive of, of, of them and also they can be pregnant. So so if we can see representation that, that would be really helpful. 
So don't create stigmatization, but rather representation. And based uh, um, has there, from your experience, has there been, how does the backlash, or has there been any backlash from your experience within the international or local market when such um, adverts are put out there? What is generally the response uh, from, um, I'll, I'll say it for this purpose, the consumer, one that being um, one from the community and then ones who are not from the community? What is generally the response when such adverts are put out? The one that comes to mind was Gillette. It was an international about um, being the best that you can, um, specifically targeted at men, and and how men reacted so negatively to that advert campaign. Um, and so I think a lot of the time, conservative people who are, are having their, their norms and their thoughts challenged um, is where a lot of the backlash actually comes from. Um, so when when the community is misrepresented, that obviously does stand out, um, and, and 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 people speak up. But often when adverts do push the edge or get um, edgy, um, the people that are feel threatened are the ones who create the loudest noise, um, and and so that's one of the big problems that we have is that. The advertisers always try and play it safe to make sure that a certain community don't get upset. Some of the your older conservative uh, consumers as well, and so advertisers should be encouraged to um, be a little more edgy and and take on challenges um, and and speak against social constructs. Would you then, uh, based on everything that you've said, then say uh, state that uh, the advertising companies employ? Would you then say that advertising companies employ negative or overly restrictive stereotypes of queer people and uh, the LGBTQ plus community overall? Yeah, absolutely, mm -hmm. um, and and that restrictions do apply, and and often it's a token. You know, as I said in my presentation where um, if we're going to represent um, an LBGT or a SOGI person in an advert, you know, we give them blue hair and a nose ring mm -hmm. uh, kind of thing. Uh, and wh when the person said it to me, I, I just want something I'll never forget now um, <laughs> kind of thing. And I think, yeah, so, so that sort of being conservative, um, conservative in, in the brief. Um, and again, some of that comes from the clients briefing the advertising industry. Um, so, so the companies commissioning the adverts um, are also restrictive um, and not wanting to represent. The term marginalization is used a lot um, in, diff in, in spaces, right? And how would you then, you how would you define the term marginalization within your particular context? So, so marginalization is about exclusion. It's about um, judgment. Um, and it's about missed opportunities. Uh, even uh, employment opportunities because, mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, so something where an advertiser could, uh, I'll go back to my supermarket example, if we can put a trans person um, as a teller in a supermarket as a cashier, um, that would give the community a lot of acceptance, but also give the public acceptance to s not feel confused or not knowing how to react um, when there is a, a trans or a gender diverse person as a cashier. Um, and that will then improve the quality of job creation for the community mm -hmm. um, and marginalization. Um, and, and so that covers exclusion as well, as where uh, people feel excluded um, and not represented. 
And how, how would you then, for your purposes, define discrimination? And how does it look like, or is it the same as marginalization? Marginalization, marginalization versus discrimination? So the, uh, direct discrimination would be you know, going against the community or speaking out against it or, or mm. not acceptance, um, which I think is a direct violation. <coughs> um, there is obviously indirect discrimination um, and, and gender stereotyping is a, a very clear indirect mm. discrimination that happens where, as I said, you know, men or a boy can't play with dolls or a, a mm. man can't wear a dress or a, yeah, a girl can't have her hair short. Mm. Yeah, and there are those who will come back and say, to what extent? To what extent are we supposed to, uh, to what extent is the advertising um, sector responsible for representation of everybody who's got an issue of representation that could be people um, um, complaining about racism, that's uh, a complaint about anybody um, who might have an issue of representation to whatever extent. What would be your comment to that? That Number one, that the industry shouldn't play it safe, that they should be inclusive, um, and that they should consult with the community. Um, uh, and it needs to be broad consultation. As I said, not just take that one person in the office uh, mm -hmm. kind of thing uh, and look out. Um, and, and if you're going to be having an advert in a rural context, you know, get a rural person involved um, kind of thing. If you're having a in a city context, make sure you have an inner city person <coughs> as part of your concert. <coughs> um, and, and, and so that, that, that for me is always important and, and, and the conversation I had with the community is to say, come talk to us, ask us questions, we'll mm. answer them, mm. uh, kind of thing. And I think that, that for us is important, is just to ask those questions and, and, and to see where we go. Um, how can the industry... There, there's no simple answer that, um, in terms of the the industry, who's always going to find um, that it's easy to represent, and so sometimes it's easier not to to take that harm. Um, and there is no right answer, um, and everyone has their own context and their own life experience. Um, a and so, if we are going to talk about um, life experiences in advertising is take it from the context of the person involved in the advert, not a representation of the community. Mm. So, so if an advert is like your deodorant, is about that person's experience of the product, um, not saying this product will solve the community's issues. It's about being that personal kind of thing, experience um, and that life experience. If you had a complaint uh, about Advert X, how would you, in your mind, um, go about making sure that it is removed? Are you aware of any mechanisms that are available to address complaints um, that offend you or that you find to be um, discriminatory in nature? So I, I do know there is the advertising um, body that looks at complaints and uh, that you can log complaints there and um, have been involved in their process historically. Mm. Um, I, I think, yeah, that conversation needs to continue with the community and to make that known. Um, I think also as an organization, you know, we have redirected people there. I, I think social media is also playing a massive role. Um, that if there are complaints that people can talk about it to pick companies up mm. um, and companies can get into the action as well and hear what the community is saying. Um, but yeah, I think the complaints process is disconnected from the community and it's, 
not easy for for people to access and uh, only people who have knowledge or experience um, or to use an organization like ourselves to act on on their behalf a representative from the <coughs> arb was here earlier on and indicated that the most efficient way to get a hold of them is through an online complaints process and i would think you just lodge the complaint online and how <coughs> How would this um, this particular mechanism, as you've just alluded to, um, how is it inaccessible or accessible? To what extent is it inaccessible and accessible for your com for the constituency that you represent? So I think number one is just the knowing that it's there and for mm. people to know how to do it, um, and and that it's a written complaint, um, and so a lot of the community struggle to put into words. Um, what, how they feel or what the issue is. Um, so I think that that's also a kind of thing that the complaint is written. Um, and that's, yeah. And I think that's, um, yeah, I'm not quite sure how to, I guess, to can do a little more consulting on that <laughs> community would also be helpful. Um, and speaking of the, the, inst the institution, and the ARB that I'm now referring to, would, who would need to be around the table for such a regulating body so that, um, so that people from the community would feel that, you know, the, I will be heard, right? Um, you've said that there's issues of access, in access, but will they understand what I'm trying to say? So who, needs, who do you think then needs to be on the other end uh, receiving the complaints and how should all of those people on the other end look like so that the community will feel represent uh, heard in that context so I think that's important that the the ARB should include um, organizations such as ourselves and other trans organizations if it if that's the area of complaint um, that the ARB along with the industry should be trained in diversity um, and get to understand that um, and that guidelines are also put in place. Um, and, and again, funding, you know, part of our organizations would love to be able to help write those guidelines, but funding is a challenge for us to be able to contribute. So, so if the industry also wants to help fund it, um, organizations to contribute to those guidelines, to be part of those commissions um, and, and to guide, um, I think that will be an important step as well. I might have misheard. Um, did you say you don't have um, any recommendations overall, or just sanctions, or did you mean just criminal sanctions? Do you have any recommendations for these particular structures besides the one I've just mentioned now on how they can better function? Yeah, I, I'm not saying, cr I, I think a lot of it should be, um, you know, from a s potentially um, fines or something like that, um, and and, the, and those kind of funds can go back to helping um, educate the community, educate the industry, um, that there's education and, and always upskilling mm. um, within the, the various bodies, um, and, and that the bodies are um, putting time and effort into ensuring that they are up to, to date with with understanding of the communities that they represent. I think that's important. Two more questions. <laughs> and <coughs> what, is, um, what is government's role in, in, in this whole process? Um, what do you think government, sh what role do you think government should be playing? And yeah, what role do you think government should be playing? <laughs> <laughs> so, so I think very much, um, Yo, there's a lot to answer to that. In this context. <laughs> In this context. <laughs> yeah. I, I think something like the hate crimes bill comes to mind. Uh, that parliament needs to... this now, Because that takes into consideration a lot of representation um, of the community and, and what's acceptable and not acceptable. 
Um, so f government needs to create frameworks, um, including legal frameworks, but also representation. Um, and, and government, you know, is the custodian of the constitution and the, they should make it uh, that the constitution is upheld. What else? Yeah, I think government also needs to talk um, up against discrimination, um, and that needs to come from from the presidency. Um, you know, even gender-based violence is, is very prevalent in the trans community. Uh, correctional rape, for argument's sake, is very very uh, problematic. So, so government, you know, part of the whole gender-based violence campaign needs to, to step up as well. Um, yeah. Okay, you just triggered another question. So <laughs> this is really now the, my last two questions. Um, <clears throat> there are those who will say that what you are calling for uh, infringes on their right to freedom of expression as guaranteed in the Constitution that you just spoke of now, um, association and trade. Um, how do you respond to that, that what you what you're now calling for and the reform that you're calling for actually could actually impact on somebody's uh, somebody else's constitutional rights. So, so freedom of expression doesn't come with freedom of no consequence. Um, and, and so th there needs to be what's for the greater good um, and what's without harm um, is my kind of... If, if your freedom of expression comes with harm um, or hate, that's not freedom. That's um, putting your beliefs into somebody else. Um, and that's not what the South African Bill of Rights is about. Um, and, and so your freedom of expression is limited within no harm. Okay, now finally, my final question. Um, there is there's the question of what came first, the chicken or the egg? And in this context, I'd ask who then is responsible um, is it the client or the agency? Um, is it the client commissioning the adverts, the agency making um, the adverts, or the consumer who is responsible um, for the failures of this process that we've been talking about? And who is then also, yeah, who is responsible? Who do you put the blame on? So it's a collective effort, and uh, everyone needs to work together. Um, I, and I think both uh, government and the ARB needs to police that um, better. Um, and so they can then help uh, the industry move forward. Um, I think advertising agencies, um, it's their revenue and it is their business. So they, they scare to up um, and they're going to commission what a client says. Um, but I if the adverts are problematic and there are consequences to it, um, agencies are going to start to not want to, to work with certain clients or clients are going to be um, a little more um, circumvent um, w with what they're doing. And, and clients do need to take on, um, be responsible as well. Uh, it's about a social pact between the agencies, community, society. Um, we have two questions. To, to what ex extent would you say the prevalence of traditional gender roles uh, in adverts, to what extent do you think this perpetuates um, stereotypes and further marginalizes the Sogi community. What is the first line of that question? The, to, to what extent does the prevalence of traditional gender roles in TV or uh, print media adverts per perpetuate stereotyping? And to what extent does that uh, then marginalize um, the Sogi community? So, so definitely that gender roles or gender uh, kind of place. Um, and, and patriarchy plays a huge part to that where uh, the male dominance comes into effect. 
um, and and is sort of the leader, the head of the house uh, kind of issues. And so that that marginalizes the community. It marginalizes that normality. I, I spoke about how advertising creates these social constructs or social accept acceptance. Um, and so that that's where the gender roles and stereotyping come into effect, um, sort of creating this normality or acceptance. And that's what we need to challenge. Um, as, as a way forward, um, how do we then transform um, the existing legal protections for the SOGI community into lived reality? Um, how do we assist the advertising sector um, to implement uh, progressive measures that will ensure that there's inclusivity and there's representativity and that there's also attitudinal change? So I think the first kind of thing that jumped to mind there is about acceptance and about um, th that people are, are normal um, and, and we're just human beings. Um, I think also not to um, ridicule and, and to make it, yeah, acceptable, rather than, hey, I've got a trans neighbor, um, uh, you know, almost like, let the society know it's wrong to chase them down the road with sticks and stones kind of things, but rather to go up and maybe it's appropriate to give them a hug or or to say, hey, you're valid. I think that, that would be good to see those kind of things in adverts, just to go in up to people. Um, and that can be as well for a disabled person, is just to go up to a disabled person and say, hey, Life's cool. Um, I'm here. Can I help you? Kind of thing. I think that that's often that visibility and acceptance and just being being there for people would be cool. Thank you, Chair. We have no further questions. Thank you, evidence leaders. Uh, from the panel, uh, Professor Majingosi, do you have uh, any questions to the witness? I do, Chair. Thank you. <coughs> I love the name of your organization, uh, Be True to Me. I like it because it can be translated into any language, you know. And it's such a simple statement that, you know, you're not forcing anyone to be what they're not, but just to be true to me. And I also want to, Chair, to, to emphasize two quotes uh, from the presentation. The one was, you know, treat us as human beings. You know, just treat us as human beings, nothing more, nothing less. But the second one that I liked a lot was that advertising must be realistic. We all exist. Show us everything. It's as simple as that. Show us everything. So, so I really want to emphasize that. I've got three questions, Chair. The first one is to ask you, please, Lian, whether you've got any resources that you can share with us either from overseas or from South Africa, where if there's any jurisdiction in Europe, Asia, wherever, where you know there's been guidelines for the advertising industry. Of course, we as a commission will also do that. But is there anything that comes to your mind in terms of resources developed overseas or in South Africa? I know in, in, in the journalism space, but also in court reporting, uh, Sonke Gender Justice and Iranti have you know, produce some guidelines on how people should report on SOGI community and what pronouns to use and what, you know, these terms translate into different languages. So I want to check that in the first place. Is, are there any resources that, you, that come to mind? If not, please can you check with the community and, and, and share with us? I, I, I think there's so much work to be done in our community and, and, and to compile so many different resources. And I think this is a golden opportunity to, to help. Um, I think uh, there's probably, I know from a South African context, it's probably lacking. Um, I think there's, as you talk about, you know, from a journalism space, um, I know there's a lot of stuff from a media perspective, from movies and TVs, but I think advertising 
th there's a huge gap um, kind of thing. I, I think that's something the commission should really look further into is what is the rest of um, the international community doing? Um, and, and I think that's something I can also reach out to, to the community and the international advocacy space to see if there is further resources. But I do think, yeah, I think there's a lot of work that we can do. Mm. Uh, as I say, I struggle with finances. Mm, mm, mm. To f you know, we, we've got a list of things like this to do and we've mm. only got resources to do that. So yeah, I think that this is something that definitely should be happening. Just to follow up on that, uh, is there any coalition of the community in the world? I mean, I know in the 19... Mid 1994, 95, there was you know gay and lesbian community, uh, no gay and lesbian coalition, chaired by Mazibugo Jar, I think. Then there was another one with uh, Pumim Tetwa and uh, is there a coalition that 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 one can go to? So that's actually a very we are meeting tomorrow to put together a um, an action plan for a coalition. Excellent. Where a group of communities are coming together, and we we've been talking for the last year. Mm. Um, and, and, and with some sp focus, but tomorrow is actually a um, an piso for the day on to, to work out how we're going to do this coalition further. I'm prophetic, I'm prophetic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was concerned about one of your answers where you talked about acceptance. We should just be accepted. Because, you know, uh, and, and this takes me to, to my second last question. You know, sometimes in discrimination, uh, marginalization, when we talk about redress, people talk, you know, use language like mainstreaming, inclusion. But inclusion can lead to assimilation, right? Into, you know, uh, uh, assimilation, acceptance, and so forth. You know, the notion of diversity without changing anything, without dismantling, decolonizing heteronormativity itself. Isn't there that danger? Absolutely. I think um, the opposite is we can't not do it. Um, and and I think we, we, we need to accept that we're not going to get everyone on board. Um, but if we can get minds changed and, and, and people moving forward, um, that that's what, what it's going to have to be. Um, we're not going to get everyone. I'm realistic in that sense. Um, but we definitely need to advocate for for inclusion and for diversity to move forward, um, and that, uh, yeah, as I say, simulation or assimilation. Um, I I actually understand the context that you're trying to say. Um, I think human beings are wanting to be assimilated, but don't want to be that there are people who want to stand out and there's those who just want to blend in. Um, and I spoke about intersectionality. Um, and I think that's important that trance is just not for rich white people or poor black people or poor um, badly educated or, or well educated uh, kind of thing. That it's across all races, all creeds, all religion, Muslim, Christian, Jewish, uh, agnostic uh, kind of thing. So, so yeah, so that intersectionality will always come into play and that people would want to stand out. Well, I mean, th th that's, that's correct. And it is encouraging that as a country we are, you know, making progress, you know, moving away from this idea that something's not African, <laughs> that actually discrimination is un-African. <laughs> Right, you know, so 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 that's a way forward, uh, and that Ubuntu should be the basis of everything, right? Uh, follow up, following up to your last answer, moving forward in terms of changing the industry, in terms of depiction, in terms of leadership transformation, and so forth. How do we avoid cultural appropriation, as well as rainbow washing, in this transformation exercise? Thank you, Chair. If I had the answer to that question, I'll be. <laughs> um, yeah, I do think that's a that's a very it's, it's a conversation that needs to continue, um, uh, and I think 
that if we look at the international space, there's a lot of, um, especially in um, some women movements where they're saying trans women aren't women. Um, and, 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 and they're putting it into this cultural ap appropriation, which, which is wrong. Um, and so there is a, a fine line in certain cases. And, and, and there are some clear kind of things where cultural appropriation is just purely, cult and it is uh, inappropriate. But there are times when it's a line. Um, and, and that's a conversation that needs to happen. And I'm guessing no one's going to get it right all the time. And, and that's going to, we're going to bump heads. Um, and if we bump heads, we grow, uh, kind of thing. We might have some bruises. But if we can give each other a hug afterwards and, and continue, I think that's how society grows. Thank you, Chair. Yes, thank you, Chairperson. If Shop A advertises and says that it provides a uniform for School B and this type of dress is for boys and that type of dress is for girls, will that amount to discrimination? So that goes back to what can government do? Um, and, and I think something, the conversation that's happened a bit in the media around the Department of Basic Education is to put some uniform policies in place um, to make sure that those kind of things don't, don't happen. So, so maybe Shop A and whatever is not discriminating in the advertising, but it's an indirect discrimination to the community. And that's where civil society needs to work even further with government to make sure that policy frameworks are in place, that those kind of indirect discriminations don't happen. Um, so, so maybe we can't take shop A on from a, a discriminative point of view because that's just been the way it has been, but rather to challenge society to re-understand what uniforms are. That was my only question, Chairperson. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Zanyoni, uh, I think uh, I'm covered with all the questions that have been asked. And uh, I would like at this stage to thank uh, Leanne uh, for your presence and your cooperation and the, all the inputs that you have given this afternoon to the commission, to the inquiry. Thank you. So thanks a million. And at the same time, let me thank all the team leaders and let me thank uh, the panelists for all the inputs that uh, you have given today. And uh, also thank uh, uh, the <coughs> media houses and uh, also our interpreters and uh, <coughs> the staff from uh, the office of the Houghton province of the South African Human Rights Commission for all the hard work of today. So we are going to adjourn for the day and then uh, we'll be starting again tomorrow at nine o'clock. So thank you and uh, the session is adjourned for the day. Uh, Lien, you are excused from the stand. Eh? Thank you very much. That's right.